Luis, welcome back, bro. Hey, man. How you doing? Great good. to be here. Good, man. I'm excited to have you back to talk about some of the shit that's going on. Oh, yeah. All around uh, Mexico and South America. And it seems like no one's paying attention to it right now. But you have had, uh, you've been balls deep in cartel world. Yeah, dude. I mean, I don't know if luckily or what, but it's just the way things go, you know. I, I'm, I'm supposed to be reporting the whole region like Latin America, but Mexico is keeping me so busy right now. It's, it's so wild what is happening. In Mexico and what is about to happen. You know, yeah. With, uh, yeah. And like I was showing you last night, we got the the tridents from my boy Manny, whose godfather is Felix Rodriguez. Dude. We're going to be going to talk to soon, hopefully. <laughs> dude, that will be massive, dude. I mean, I've been, I've been after Felix Rodriguez for a while. I published this story about the involvement of the CIA in the murder of Kiki Camarena back in 97. Mm -hmm. The first time I published that story was in 2013 in a Mexican magazine called Proceso before several years before the documentary that it's now showing on amazon and um and i try to get a hold of felix but he's a shadowy man i mean it's it's hard to get a hold of him right mm -hmm. you see him you've seen him like once every now like on 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 interviews regarding the killing of che guevara yeah. and his operations in cuba and bolivia and south america but he's never really talked about Mexico, right? And what he did in Mexico by, back in the 80s. It right. will be ma massive. Right. If we can ha get a hold of him, like, you know? Yeah, when one of the first documentaries you pointed out to me before we you first came on the show was that documentary called, I think it was The Last Narc, Yeah, was it? With, yeah. um, with I forget who the other guy was, uh, but he basically, they found out somehow that there was a Cuban guy in the room when they were torturing Kiki, mm -hmm. And the Cuban guy was most likely Felix. Yeah, I mean, that's what sources say all the time, right? And mm -hmm. th there is like available transcripts of that recording where they're torturing Kiki Camarena. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, for some reason, the file, I mean, the audio files have never been out. They, I mean, several officials also say that they don't exist, that those tapes are fake, they don't really exist, and there's mm -hmm. a fucking rumor. But there are transcripts of the, of the whole call. Mm -hmm. The thing is the transcripts, they don't identify anyone, right, on, on the room. They kind of like identify Caro Quintero allegedly, but then again, Caro Quintero, he's an old man. He's always denied that, it, that he actually did something to hurt Kiki Camarena. Mm -hmm. Everybody is denying his invol their involvement in right. the, the whole Kiki Camarena case. Right, so, right. I mean. And Felix, so Felix was brought into the CIA, I think like leading up to the Bay of Pigs, right? When they were training a bunch of the Cubans or the Cuban Americans to yeah. like basically go over there and invade and fight. Yeah, exactly. He was like, he was a massive operator, right? He was, uh, he's a Cuban mm -hmm. that, that used to know his country so well, but he was actually working for the US government with the CIA as an asset because he knew the region, he knew the language and he was right. extremely, um, I mean, skilled for, for what he had to do. I mean, he found El Che Guevara, right, in Bolivia. So he was like, nice. he was like skilled, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey guys, just wanted to drop in real quick to let you know that on the back end of this YouTube channel, it says that 70% of the viewers have not yet hit the subscribe button. So if you enjoyed this podcast and you want to see more underground investigative episodes like this one, I want to ask you a favor and that's to simply hit the subscribe button below this video. By doing this, you're enabling the podcast to get in front of and reach more people, which allows this thing to sustain itself and helps us to get more strange and interesting guests on the show. So if you will all just do me the favor and subscribe to the YouTube channel, I promise to keep making these episodes better every single week. Thank you all. I love you. I'm back to the show. Yeah. He was training the people in Mexico, the guerrillas, right, to go fight over in Nicaragua. Yeah, so what was happening there is that they... The U.S. government through the CIA had this arrangement with Mexican criminal organizations. They, they weren't still called cartels back then, back in the 80s. The deal was you train our people in the use of arms and, you know, fire weapons, all that, all that stuff. So they go and fight in Central America against the communism um, and we'll let you a free pass for planes, airplanes packed with cocaine into the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. That was the deal. I, the first time I reported this story, I met uh, Tosh Plumley, a great pilot uh, out of New Mexico. 
And he showed me a lot of like his paperwork for all the stuff he did with the CIA. He was in charge of bringing these uh, loads of cocaine on private small planes. Sometimes there were like small Cessnas. <clears throat> across the border from a ranch in Veracruz and several other places in Mexico <clears throat> back to the U.S. And at the same time, Caro Quintero, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, and Ernesto Fonseca, those guys were the head of what was called the Guadalajara Federation, right? Right. And they were training people. They were training all these Mexican henchmen to go and fight in Central America. I don't think they actually knew what was really happening in the the broader scope you know that like they were fighting the contras and they were i think they knew that they needed to train armed people to go and fight in central america but probably they didn't understand who was behind the whole thing because that was one of the main things that felix was known for right to, for for keeping a low profile on the cias mm -hmm. you know like no no paper trail, no money trail, all that kind of stuff. So, so Felix probably went to these guys like Carl Quintero and and uh, and Felix and basically said, "We want to train our guy." He didn't say he was CIA. He probably just said, "We want to train your guys to fight." Yeah, what I think for... it's yeah. Well, I mean, pro it's pr probably Felix just sold the version that he had a way to keep bringing cocaine into the U.S. as a free pass. He's probably, he probably said, yeah. like, you know what, I'm a, I'm a huge trafficker, so uh, traffic on the Guano, whatever, and I'm, I'm, I can help you out because I have connections, so we can bring a lot of airplanes. So when the Mexican criminal organization said, like, okay, this is a free pass, it's actually working, they don't give a shit what, what do they have to pay or what they have to do in order for, to right. do that. Their eyes are on questions. the target. They want money, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they're probably saying... Just train these people. We need. I need an army. I need a personal army. Whatever. I'm fighting a, another criminal organizations. Whatever. Central America. Mm. So just train a lot of my people. So they're like, yes, we'll 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 train your people in the use of arms. Whatever. Mm -hmm. If you keep letting us, you know. And <clears throat> that's where uh, Kiki Camarena, this former DA agent, um, showed up. He found first this uh, huge property where they were. Uh, harvesting weed, uh, marijuana, in, in Chihuahua, the biggest plantation they've ever found, ever. But also he found these ranches where they were training these armed people. And he was about to call on his boss. He has he had asked for a meeting with uh, this uh, DA supervisor called Kukendall. He's the only one who has never done any interviews when it comes to that story. He was the supervisor. He was Kiki Camarena's supervisor. So, so if someone knows the, what really happened, it's Kukendall. But he even sued the production company of The Last Narc for how they portrayed his role in the whole thing. Really? So he's been out of it. Like, he's been out of every story. He's mentioned, because he's the main guy. He was the supervisor. He knows what happened. Um, but he's never, he's never, has never talked about it. So... Uh, I don't know. That's also kind of like sketchy, right? Because you would you would come out and say like, yeah, my agents were working good, whatever. Kiki Camarena requested a meeting to tell me something before he was kidnapped and eventually killed. <clears throat> this yeah. guy, his supervisor, he was in the office when Kiki got kidnapped. <clears throat> he was uh, he was in the office, and Kiki Camarena was kidnapped right in front of the right headquarters. Front. Right, going to lunch, right? Yeah, Waiting exactly. for his wife. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Is this guy still alive? Uh, cooking doll? Yeah. I think he is. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Probably between him and Felix, they have the whole fucking truth, you know, of what happened. If they're going to tell the truth, like sometimes, I don't know, like they're probably going to die before they actually yeah. tell. Felix us. is getting old, man. He's Felix got, is what, like 80 something, right? Yeah, he's in his late 80s and he can either be, he, I, walks around with a cane apparently and yeah. gets around very slow. And Dude, he needs to, he needs to come clean before he leaves this <laughs> world, dude. <laughs> <laughs> just to know, know. <laughs> I mean, he's probably he was probably. I mean, it's probably true that he he, he could say like I wasn't even there. Mm. I swear to God, whatever. <laughs> we'll take a Bible to, for, yeah. to, to swear on it, dude. It's crazy. It's like what we were saying last night. It's like the olden days of when the the Guadalajara Federation controlled everything. It seemed like it was a much more smooth operation, way less bloodshed than what it is now with all the factions that are. Yeah competing for power down yeah. there in mexico right now so r right now in mexico 
what is the dynamic and the power structure of the cartels? Is it mainly just the Sinaloa cartel and the New Generation cartel? Yeah, well, basically those are the... This is what changed through these years since the 80s, probably. Back then, they were basically or Korean organizations. They were cartels. They were drug cartels. I don't think it's accurate to call them drug cartels anymore. We, we keep hearing the same thing over the news, right? Like drug cartels is probably the easiest way uh, to make uh, people to sim- to oversimplify what these criminal organizations are, but um, but I don't think it's accurate at all because they're not just drug cartels. Back then, um, Felix Gallardo and all these dudes they were trafficking drugs, and that was their their their, their whole business, right? They didn't have any other business. But these criminal organizations right now that we're dealing with today, they're everything but drug cartels. Drug is just one uh, revenue stream from a huge uh, array of different revenues they, they get. Like, they're involved in extortion, they're involved in kidnapping, they're involved in monopolizing, they're involved in uh, uh, b- b- basically the um, sites of corruption, right? Like, it, it, let's say you want to, you, you're running to be a local president for a municipality in Mexico. You want to win. So the cartel shows up with you, say like, okay, you want to win this thing? We can put a lot of money and get you a lot of votes so you win the election but in order uh, after you get uh, elected what you're going to do with us is you're going to give us all the contracts for construction for constructing hospitals uh, roads uh, schools new developments all that stuff because that's the way they're going to make money out of it on these semi-legal things right they're monopolizing water they're monopolizing gold mines they're monopolizing a lot of like natural resources all over Mexico. Now they're um, all over with the immigration. They're basically handling the whole illegal immigration path and and networks in in Mexico and Central America. So they're everywhere where there is money to be made. But cocaine is still like 80% of the revenue, right? Yeah, cocaine is pretty large still, but I'm I'm not sure if I will call cocaine it's still a main revenue for them. I think it's a you steady. You even call it a main revenue. No, I think it's a steady revenue. Probably the most steady revenue they have. But when you talk, when you have things like fentanyl, which is huge revenue for them, I think that that's, that that's uh, displacing the revenue from cocaine. Cocaine right now, it's at its lowest price per kilo in the U.S. I thought I saw a story. I ta- I've talked about it on this podcast recently. Actually, I thought I saw a story somewhere where. One of the bosses of the Sinaloa cartel put out some sort of message to all of the other bosses or people that were working in the cartel saying that if they caught anybody mixing fentanyl into cocaine, they'd be executed or something yeah. like that. And there was like signs or something they put out. Yeah. yeah. If, if, you, if you take into account that they make public these, um, this announcement... It's not for their henchmen, right? Because they have private communication. They have private ways to communicate with the other organizations and, and stuff without making it public. They have walkies. They have means to reach every other member of the organization to tell them there is a ban, right? Mm-hmm. But the fact that they make it public says that they're talking to us, uh, right? To, to people, propaganda. to media. It's propaganda, exactly. That's what they leave banners. So that's what they leave like bodies with a small mountain of fentanyl pills. So that's literally to this mark, to unmark themselves from the whole industry, saying like, no, we're the good guys. We're enforcing side by side with you guys, US and Mexico government. We're working all together to stop the fentanyl production. But that's bullshit. They're just moving kitchens to other places. Right now, if you go to Sinaloa, it's really hard to find a laugh, a, a fentanyl laugh in Sinaloa, right? Because there's a lot of operations. They don't want to be, you know, like on the spot and that stuff. This is the article. <laughs> Sinaloa cartel's mes- message to members. Stop yeah. making fentanyl or, or die. die. Yeah. Crime crime group yields to intensifying U.S. law enforcement pressure and is kidnapping or killing producers who defy the man. Is there a picture of the banners that they're posting? Oh, no, it's a, paid, it's a it's paywall. A paywall. <clears throat> Yeah, but yeah. They, they, so this is all propaganda. This is just to get the media attention. That's the, that's what it was intended for, right? right. For articles like this. Like, yeah. So everybody says like, okay, the, and they want the U.S. media attention. That's what they want, right? They reach out to journalists. They reach out to um, um, Mexican officials. They put out banners on fl- that they, they they think it's gonna make flashy news 
headlines yeah you know yeah. Uh, the next day and we all fall for it i mean of course my editor asked me like hey do you want to write a story or not and i'm like okay let me just call some of these contacts i have in sinaloa to see mm -hmm. what they say what they feel and of course everybody said like dude it's bullshit where i mean everybody's still you know cooking fentanyl it's just a way to make it look like the organization is not involved anymore because mm. even rivals like the guys in um in tijuana right the arellano felix organization they've been rivals forever with a with a chapitos faction with a sinaloa cartel are they still legitimate <clears throat> they're still around i mean it's not handled by the main family members uh, but they're still around they're, they're, the organization kept the name but it's just new players right like left so leftovers of mm. probably the leftovers so mm. Um, but even so, they also set up banners all over Tijuana saying like, yeah, we support or rivals initiative of banning fentanyl also on our territory in Tijuana. So if we find fentanyl, whatever. But if you go to Tijuana, dude, it's so easy to get a hold of these M30 fake uh, oxys or fake pills, you know, which are all, all um, laced with fentanyl. So... It hasn't stopped. I mean, uh, the fentanyl trade, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't even wind down. It's it's still huge. They just moved the kitchens. I wrote a story about the kitchens uh, mo being moved to uh, Bogota in Colombia. They started yeah. moving the whole the whole thing to small apartments in Bogota, to San Luis Potosí. So they're different Mexican states. That's literally what's happening. So... Where the cartels are at now, like you, like you just mentioned, they're not just drug cartels anymore. They are multinational empires. Exactly. Like yes. They're 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 controlling many states or countries in South America, mm -hmm. Mexico. How many total countries are they? Dude, I mean, I guess I don't know, dude. I mean, it's gotta be hard because because again, you have to understand these these are like criminal enterprises or criminal insurgencies, right? right. They, they, they're huge. And they're not vertical. There's not like a single boss and then a bunch of people. They're like more horizontal organizations with with smaller verticals, um, tiers. You know, you have a boss and then probably four guys and then below, you know, mm -hmm. but for the most part, they're horizontal organizations, very dynamic. So you kill one, they move another one. Mm -hmm. If you arrest one, just the next one pops up. Right. But the organization keeps at it, right? <clears throat> so that means... When you try to identify what is and or who is a member of a cartel, it's kind of hard because the old lady who is a lookout on, on a corner for the cartel, is she part of the cartel or is she just getting, you know, 20 bucks a month to mm. make a call whenever she sees something strange? Uh, <clears throat> what they call cartel, they themselves, the people who call themselves cartel are just the henchmen, the armed people. Uh, when you go to Sinaloa or to with, with the guys of the Jalisco or New Generation, whatever, uh, what we see as the armed branch of an organization, that's what they call cartel. So if you say like, if you when sicarios, I, exactly, basically sicarios. And when I interview people that are managing the organization, that are in charge of money or attorneys or making decisions, they hate it when you call them cartel members, like right. So, so you're a cartel member. They're like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the organization, right? The Sinaloa organization. Yeah. The cartel is just the arm, the branch of our organization. Right. <clears throat> that's how they see it, and I think that's probably when we were having a hard time to identify what is cartel, who represents a cartel. Again, the buyers of the whole thing of the drugs, even if they pay with money or they paying with arms, are on this side of, of the border, right? Uh, are on the U.S. side? On the U.S. side. I mean, that's that's where the drugs are intended to come. So most of the buyers are on the U.S. side of the border. So are they cartel members or are they part of the organization or are they just clients? Like, it's hard to tell who, it, like the boundaries of what we call a criminal enterprise, right? <clears throat> because when you think about like, let's think about like a proper enterprise, like let's think about Coca-Cola, right? You have employees and then you have a buyer, on large scale. So they say like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a distributor for you. But do they work for Coca-Cola or they're just distributors? How does, I mean, how, do, how does that play out? In the yeah. criminal world, the whole thing is the, to get arms right. and money from the US and drugs into the US. So you need a buyer. Even before you start cooking or buying, if you wanna get into it like as, as an independent, 
what you first need is a client, right? Someone who's already buying your shit. Mm -hmm. So you will go to LA or Miami or whatever and find a buyer. And you say like, hey man, I have the capability to bring you 10 kilos of cocaine, purest quality, whatever. And when that person agree and it says like, okay, yes, uh, let's do it. Then you go to your source and then source yourself and make money within that transaction. But then it, that, that's literally how the whole world of drug trafficking works, mm -hmm. right? So there's a bunch of them representing the cartel or the criminal organization on this side of the border. Usual buyers, usual distributors, people that knows Uh, what uh, arms they, they need back in Mexico, you know, where to source them. Mm. And they're also making money out of it or collecting the whole money for the, uh, for the uh, criminal organizations, laundering money through hotels, through real estate, through a bunch of different um, industries. And they are part of the organization, right? They are probably the most important part of the fucking organization. They're not... Uh, right. Right? They're not the shots, but they're handling the money. They're handling the whole part of the operation that makes a criminal organization work. They're like the sales team. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So right now, basically what we have in Mexico is it's this dynamic, very dynamic operation between criminal enterprises or, or, or criminal insurgencies that they work uh, very, they work side by side with the Mexican government as well in terms of corruption, in terms of getting rid of rivalry or even political rivals. You know, these past uh, federal elections, we have the uh, most violent uh, election process in, in Mexico's history. There were over 19 candidates killed all over Mexico. What? It When? was fucking wild. It, it was, uh, I think, two years ago, <clears throat> two or three years ago. Actual presidential candidates, uh, not all presidential, political like candidates. political candidates. Yes, okay. like uh, state state governors, local uh, uh, municipal uh, uh, mayors, um, presidential candidates. It was wild, dude, and that it that only shows you that a political, the political aspect of Mexico. It's not only political anymore; it's also criminal. They're embedded, right? Because they order these hits. Uh, why else will a cartel or a criminal organization go and kill a politician if they don't have stakes in politics, right? Mm -hmm. So that means they work side by side. And right now there are two main factions, which is the Sinaloa cartel with, with the Sinaloa organization with a bunch of different factions and the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, which is now breaking, starting to break into little factions as well. Those are the, the main ones not the only ones there there are still the uh setas vieja escuela which is a branch of the old setas cartel right um you have the cartel del golfo cartel del noreste um you have a, a you, you even have the worst ones are on the east coast right mm, yeah i mean <clears throat> i don't think they they are like on the east coast because they really operate in whole mexico but they have stronger stakes on the east coast because that's where you have the biggest international ports seaports mm. where the precursors arms money uh, are coming in right they're coming in from the gulf they're coming in from from i'm, I'm sorry from the west coast from from mm. the west coast mm. so so you have all the coast of sinaloa and all the coast of michoacan mm. right and, and and so so that's where the, the uh two main cartels are based or operating probably more right. strongly. Mm. And then you have on the northeast part of Mexico, in Tamaulipas, Nuevo León, you have the Cartel del Noreste, which is a strong cartel, also a branch of the Zetas. Uh, and then on the southern part of Mexico, you have this really interesting new development, which is a, a, an indigenous cartel. They're called Cartel Chamula. Chamula, it's an indigenous community from southern Mexico, um, Maya descendant. And they formed their own cartel, like their own criminal organization to fight yeah. against the Jalisco, fight against the Sinaloa cartel, and to handle their own, their own shit. And they communicate on this Mayan uh, language between each other. And you have to be a Chamula in order to be part of the Chamula cartel. Whoa. So you, the, the dynamics of the criminal organizations in Mexico are, are wild and are ever-changing 
So it's really hard to put a black and white thing on them. Like these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. These are the most violent. These are you know the the main ones because there's a, a bunch of them. If you if, even if you talk about just a single organization like the Sinaloa Cartel, there's a bunch of factions. You have Mayo Zambada's faction. You have Los Chapitos faction. You used to have the Mini League or the Damasos faction. Mm-hmm. Uh, you used to have Los Rusos faction, right? So you you have a but then you have different smaller families like Los Salazar, Los Casares, etc., etc., etc. So you have right. a bunch of different families. And when you talk about the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, for the most part, they are a single brand. But right now, it's breaking down into the Jardineros and etc., 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 like different other like mm-hmm. smaller players that are trying to break their own branch of the same organization. That's interesting what you said about the uh, the indigenous cartel in southern Mexico. We just had a guy on here a couple months ago, or maybe two months ago, this guy named Luke, who explores southern Mexico and South Meso- like Mesoamerica, Central America. And he basically explores all these hidden cities. And there is like millions of miles of hit uncharted cities in the jungle down there yeah. in sou- southern Mexico and Central America. And he says like sometimes when you go out to like these temples he's like they're guarded by armed cartel members Mm -hmm. because these guys will loot those places looking for gold and shit and looking for treasure and and artifacts and and pottery and artwork and they'll sell it on the black market for tons of money a hundred percent true man yeah that's not that that, that's what i was telling like these guys are not dealing with drugs they have a branch that it's looking for gold that are looking for gold or silver or uh, ancient artifacts, you know, to, mm-hmm. to sell, like to traffic and all that stuff. And that's literally like, like how it works. The thing is, <clears throat> these criminal organizations are going to be around like flies around shit when, when there's money to be made, right? Yeah. It, when you go to places like the um, Sea of Cortez in, in Baja California, beautiful sea, and you have a huge, uh, you have a season where a lot of um, jellyfish come out come up right so that's that's not working for tourism and shit so the uh, local fishermen they started like fishing all these um, jellyfish and there was interest by uh, the uh, by a couple of uh, companies in Taiwan to buy all the jellyfish from them because really? they eventually dehydrate them treat them with salt and sell it to China because it's a it's a luxury food in, really? in China <clears throat> So when the cartel learned about that, they're like, okay, so you're making literally millions of dollars out of yellowfish that we don't use in Mexico. Okay, we're, we're in. So they, they started going in, the Sinaloa cartel particularly, by threatening local fishermen. They killed one and they burned a couple of, of the um, uh, uh, trailers where they moved the yellowfish just to, to make a statement and say like, hey, you're not you're not gonna deal directly with these Taiwanese companies. We are gonna be in the middle. We're gonna buy from you, super cheap. There is there is no permission for anyone to go out into the sea without our permission. You need to ask us for permission to go and fish yellowfish before you do. So we know how many exactly you got out of the sea and we have control of the whole operation. We're gonna make money out of it. So they monopolize the whole yellowfish business now in they're literally like a parasite to any sort of fucking money-making operation that exists down there like it's like communism yeah yeah literally what the i wonder what china uses the jellyfish for they eat it they eat jellyfish yeah yeah they 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 dehydrate the yellowfish they treat it with salt and they eat it like like it's like a delicacy yeah it's like delicacy yeah it's like it's like you find some photos i wonder if it tastes good I, uh, 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 this present peanut butter and jellyfish sandwich. <laughs> it seems to be like super salty. I mean, oh, that's really? what I've been told that it's super, extremely salty. Probably not, not tasting good for us, but, um, jellyfish is eaten in China and other Asian countries. In China, jellyfish is eaten as a delicacy in many ways, including in salads, a part of cold appetizers and marinated dish. Oh, hmm. it doesn't look bad. I bet you it was some soy sauce, but you, I bet you it was pretty good. Ah, I'm not sure, man, because if it's already salty, could you imagine that even with like soy sauce? Oh, yeah, that might be too salty. Dehydrated and pickled with sesame oil and salads. I want to try some now. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't so, feel yeah, so inclined to. <laughs> the fishermen were making millions of dollars harvesting these jellyfish. Yeah. 
and now they're being taxed by the cartels. Exactly, just as, as what happened with the. Uh, I mean, is it a fair know. is it a fair tax or is it a tax that no, literally it's, it's like crazy. cripples their business? Literally, these these past season they they lost the whole season because they they couldn't pay the. I'm the saying, is it a fair tax? Like, is uh, yeah, it, like is a it fair. fair. It is fair. Twenty you know, right? percent's fair. <laughs> they yeah, fifty there's no would be fun. unfair. <laughs> dude, that's there's no fair game. You know? Yeah, dude. Yeah, so it's so it's so it's wild. They had to stop the, the whole season because they they didn't want to deal with with cartels, right? They were too afraid. It was wild. <sighs> What's up, guys? I'm super psyched to introduce to you another product that I've been using for years now that was also recommended to me by the world-renowned nutritional scientist, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, and it is called Keto Brains. Keto Brains Nootropic Creamer is a way to perfectly dial in your morning beverage to bring you razor-sharp focus on demand. I start out every day with Keto Brains in my cup of coffee to combat the midday slump, and I use it for pre-workout. Keto Brain's nootropic creamer has efficacious doses of focus-inducing alpha-GPC, lion's mane, alpha-wave-promoting L-theanine, and ketone-stimulating C8-MCT powder. And all of those high-functioning nootropics are packed into a delicious, creamy coconut powder. It tastes amazing, it's a keto nootropic powerhouse, and it tickles all the right neurotransmitters to give you the flow and jitter-free energy with absolutely zero crash. There's no dosage tricks involved, it's just one scoop is a full serving, you can put it in your coffee, your tea, put it in your water, whatever you want, and you get 30 full doses per package. There's no pills, and there's absolutely no waiting for it to work. It kicks in like that. You can keep your brain razor sharp, primed, and ready for action with Keto Brain's Nootropic Creamer. Whether you're an entrepreneur juggling multiple projects, a student studying for exams, or you're an athlete that's trying to optimize your training, Keto Brain's will not let you down. All right, here, I'm going to list all the ingredients contained in Keto Brain's and what they do. It increases ketone production via AG C8 MCT powder. It increases acetylcholine and HGH production via 300 milligrams of alpha GPC. It increases GABA and alpha wave production via 250 milligrams of L-theanine. And it increases BDNF and NGF via 500 milligrams of lion's mane mushrooms. And these are all carefully sourced and third-party tested ingredients. This stuff quite literally increases acute brain function, protects your brain and mitochondria long-term, and last but not least, it makes your coffee delicious. If you're interested in Keto Brains and you wanna get a big discount, just go to the link in the description below, ketobrains.com, and use the promo code DANNY20 when you check out. Again, that's ketobrains.com. Hit the link below and use the promo code Danny20 at checkout. Back to the show. I spoke with one of these fishermen and he's like, dude, I'm I'm too scared to go out and you know ask for who's gonna ask for permission and how is that gonna work? And right. if you're in the middle and you know, they think that they're you're ripping them off and so like, no, you got more yellowfish than what you're telling me, whatever. So he was like too afraid. Well, didn't you just do a story about some farmers who were getting extorted? They were basically taxing them so much, and the farmers got to a point where it's like they're not making enough money on harvesting whatever it was they were avocados. The avocados. They weren't making enough money, so where they either had to die fighting against the cartel or die of starvation because they weren't going to make any money. Yeah, Th this is this has been happening in Mexico for a while. Every Super Bowl season, the U.S. consumes so many avocados and every <laughs> guacamole. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that it makes a war in Mexico. We love guac, <laughs> dude. Every every Super Bowl season is war season in Mexico. So now there is a police called the Avocado Police, La Policía del Aguacate in Michoacán. It's basically civilians geared up on their own resources to look over. Michoacán, that's in Sinaloa? That's in. Uh, or that's Sinaloa, that's in Michoacán. No, 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 Michoacán's a different state. Okay, okay, but it's, okay, okay uh, it. it's central Mexico. Okay. Um, so they, 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 that's where the self-defense groups came uh, up 10 years ago with the Polito Mora, right? The, the first time they basically armed themselves and said, like, we're going to fight against cartel. We're going to fucking die. Um, eventually, they, they won their first fight, which was a great pre precedent for, I mean, a great uh, background for, for Mexico. Mm -hmm. So there started, like, a lot of people started form forming their own uh, guerrillas or their own self-defense groups until cartels said, like, you know what? Fuck it. We, we had enough. So last, la no, this year, I was in Michoacan because they killed the uh, founder of the self-defense groups, uh, a man, a very fucking brave man, a farmer called Hipólito Mora. He was the leader. He was kind of like the uh, central figure for every other self-defense groups in Mexico, right? And and they killed him on the, on his way back to his house from his farm, and they burned him alive 
inside his pickup truck. He had he had guard by the Mexican state officials. They they put him guards to protect his life because he has been receiving threats. Mm-hmm. Even they they all got killed and and burned inside the vehicles. It was it was sad and alarming. For I visited his house. I visited the place where he was burned, where his body was burned. Dude, everybody was like quiet, like in a fucking funeral. No one was like saying anything. The town looked deserted. It was really. <clears throat> I don't know, dude. It it was like, yeah, kind of like sad and scary at the same time. Um, so what's going to happen with this farm? Well, they they kept it. The, Who the, kept it? The, the the fucking cartels. The cartels kept all of his land. So they um, killed him. And they got away with stealing his yeah. fucking farm. Yeah, dude. And very recently, uh, probably the story you were talking about, uh, probably like two weeks ago, in Mexico State, these farmers also got extorted they, they've been extorted forever by, by la familia michoacana another cartel in central mexico but they they asked for twice what they were getting they were paying one peso per square foot on, on what they whatever they were harvesting one uh, a, a peso it's uh right now it's uh 18 pesos per dollar so it's pr- probably a peso is not significant in u.s currency but uh but for a mexican one per, peso per square per square foot, foot. Of, of, the, of. of what they were har- harvesting, right? A lot of corn, beans, whatever they're harvesting. Okay. So if you have, I don't know, uh, uh, 10,000 square meters of whatever you're harvesting, you need to pay a peso for every square foot, right, of that. And they asked them for twice that. They're like, okay, so this year you're going to have to pay, starting double. this year, double, two pesos per square foot. They had a really bad season because they it, it didn't rain in that part of Mexico this season, mm-hmm. so they were like, "Dude, w- there's no way we can pay that." So they're like, "Well, you either pay or you die." They said yes, but they met a night before. They had to meet these guys to pay their the taxing, right? And they met at a soccer field in this little town in Mexico. The the cartel members showed up all geared up as usual, dressed as military members, whatever. And then the whole community showed up. But they showed up with uh, with uh, shotguns, machetes, sticks and stones. And they were like, we're not paying shit, man. And a fucking hell broke loose. You, you see the videos, there's people getting cold, killed like that. Like, boom, right in the fucking head. And then another guy in the back is like, boom, you killed my friend. Everybody started killing everyone. In total, there were 14 murders. 11 of those murders were cartel members. So that was a big win for that community. Wow. They were like, because they killed the leader of the La Familia Michoacana in that region. Oh, no right? shit. So they're like, fuck off. Now, this past week, they came back. La Familia Michoacana came back to that town and kidnapped a lot of young girls, a lot of babies, mothers. Kept They're keeping them as ransom. So they, because they're asking, like, turn, o- turn over your leaders, the guys who started this fucking fight. Turn them off, over to us, or we're not going to, uh, we're going to kill our, all, the, all your family members. And the situation, it's still tense. I mean, they still haven't released uh, the kids, the women, because they want to, they want the community to turn over the, the leaders of who started that revolt against the cartel. To teach them a lesson. Right? And what does the Mexican military do about this? Are they asking Nothing. them to help? Nothing. They've been asking for help for probably the last five years, this community. And and the, the Mexican army or the Mexican government has never showed up. What the Mexican president said was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, we knew about, we knew about those guys. They were major targets for us. We were, we were just uh, unable to find them before. But they're dead now. So you guys are good. And that's it. That's literally it. Yeah, dude, it's it's mind blowing what's happening right now in Mexico. That's fucking insane, man. Wild. Now, who who is so you just got done with a you did a really big interview with, and I think did you partner with <clears throat> Grillo to release it? Yeah. What 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 was that interview? That was the, with the guy who basically was Damaso Lopez, right? Mm-hmm. He was partners with with El Chapo yeah. or he was his, started out as his security El yeah. Chapo like he gained his trust over the years however long it was and then eventually El Chapo made a deal with him saying if I ever get pinched or if I ever get killed you're gonna take my spot yeah exactly and this guy that you met with was his, his son. son 
Yes. Got it. So How basically, the, the, the Damasos uh, started off when, when El Chapo escaped for the first time from, from prison in Mexico, right? His first... He helped him escape. He, he was the director of the, oh. of the prison. He was, he was an attorney, and, and he was the director of that prison. Right, right, right. So he helped El Chapo escape. So when El Chapo escaped, he knew they were going to come after him. So El Chapo offered him a job. He's like, okay, after I'm gone, come and look for me in, in Sinaloa, mm -hmm. and I'll give you a job. And he made this guy, Damaso Lopez Nunez, uh, El Licenciado, uh, he made him his right hand in the cartel on his faction, right? So he was dealing with, he was b basically calling the shots. Like, even though I'm going to get a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of these comments saying, no, dude, uh, he was never a shot call or whatever. He was the brains behind El Chapo. Right? El Chapo will consult everything to him. It was like, really? okay, do we want to, what do we do? We're facing these and that. And he, will, he, was, he was a smart man. He was, he was an, a, a fucking attorney. So he will say like, okay, let's not go into a fight. Let's do these. Or let's go into the, a fight. Let's form a new group. Let's move money here and there. He was El Chapo's right hand, his most trusted man. Mm. And they became uh, compadres, basically. He was the uh, godfather to his sons, mm -hmm. and Damaso was godfather to Los Chapitos. Right. So they were family, basically. Yeah. Right? They were embedded with them. They were family. They grew up together. Uh, the son of, of Damaso Lopez Nunez, Damaso Lopez Serrano, El Mini Leak, uh, he was basically part of Los Chapitos. They, they grew up together. He was best friends with Alfredo. He was best friends with... Uh, Edgar, uh, the, the youngest uh, of Los Chapitos. And eventually, when El Chapo got kidnapped, El Chapo got... Um, was he friends uh, with... Um, was El Mini League good friends with... Um, Ovidio. Ovidio. Uh, and Ivan Archivaldo, yeah. all those guys. They, they literally grew up together. They, 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 he was uh, best friends with El Mayo's son as well, Del Mayo Gordo. Oh, wow. So he was like... There was, there was a pack of narco juniors, you know, uh, basically owning the whole fucking state of Sinaloa. And um, so what happened is when they arrested El Chapo and he was, got extradited, he sent a letter to, to Damaso, to a licenciado, saying that all of the money was for his four kids and his wife, Emma Coronel, right? But the organization, he was going to leave that in the hand of those, the Damasos, right? The Elik and El Mini Leak. Probably it was a smart move. Wait, wait, wait. So the money, meaning the money that they already, the yeah. cash or the, the income that the business was bringing in? I guess both. Like the, the cash that he already had, the, the properties, all that shit. Because on the letter, what he said, it was like, you already have enough money. Just get out, get out of this shit. Live your life. So you have kids. more than enough to his kids and his wife. You live, you live your life. Mm -hmm. You have more than enough to live a good life and leave the organization in the hands of Damas. Right, it was probably a smart move because El Chapo probably thought that these was coming, these war against Los Chapitos, and that they're gonna end like him, extradited yeah. to the U.S., facing right. life sentences and right. that kind of shit. So he didn't want that for his kids. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, you don't want like let 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 El, El Licenciado take the fucking heat and you guys retire right. and leave well. Well, they didn't. They didn't want to do that. They, they, they were like, "Fuck no!" The organization is ours. We're the head of the organization right now. They didn't listen to his dad, and they started fighting against the Damasos, against their godfather, basically the the one in charge. For what I understand, Damaso El Licenciado tried to negotiate. Right, he tried to like say, like, guys, this is what your dad wants to happen to the organization. I don't want to fight with you. But then they started, you know killing his henchmen, killing his security people. The saying, Chapito like, yeah, started killing Chapito his? Started killing his, for what, for what Mindy League told me, like, his version of the story. Mm -hmm. And every time they will come after them, saying like, hey, why, why are you killing our people? They're like, oh, dude, it was a mistake, sorry. My, my guys were like really high or really drunk, whatever, but I'm going to give them a lesson, sorry about that. And they keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Until Damaso Lopez... Serrano, El Minilik, got fed up with it. And he talked to his dad. He's like, dude, I'm going to go all in against Los Chapitos. Fuck it. His dad was like, dude, we, we, don't, we don't need a fight. We don't want to fight between a family, within a single faction. Let's just solve this out. He gathered a group of other cartel members uh, from 
everywhere, even from like ma mafia people from Canada, like from everywhere, that they hated on was Chapitos, right? So he gathered a group, made a, a, a WhatsApp group, and said like, hey, we need to get rid of these fuckers. Like, they're just making too much waves here in Sinaloa. We don't want them. What do we do? So they started planning. And by the birthday of the oldest, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman, he was celebrating in, in Guadalajara, mm. Popan, at this fancy restaurant. And they kidnapped the four sons of El Chapo. The order was to kill them, right? But El Mayo got in the middle. They tried to negotiate. And then El Chapo was in prison in Ciudad Juarez, right at the border between uh, El Paso, Texas, and Mexico. And from there... Oh, this is before he was extradited. Before he was, uh, 2017, probably a couple of months before he was extradited. 2016, I'm sorry. So he called, he, he managed to get the news from the, from the guards there. Mm -hmm. And he requested a call. So he called a prison in Jalisco, where El Cholo, his right hand, his henchman, El Cholo was arrested. And he said like, hey, Cholo, I know you get along well. We get along well with El Mancho's people, whatever. I know that El Mencho's, the head of the Jalisco cartel, new generation, I know that his son is in prison with you and your friends. But you know what? This is no time to make friends. I need you to kidnap him inside prison to make him disappear until they let my kids go. So El Cholo went after the son of El Mencho inside prison, kidnapped the kid, made the director of that prison call El Mencho and said like, hey dude, your kid is nowhere to be found. And this is a message to you. As long as soon as you free my kids that are kidnapped, I'll free yours. Meaning Los Chapitos. Meaning Los Chapitos. Okay. So so basically El Mencho was like, I'm not I'm not part of this shit, but it's my turf, right? It's it's Guadalajara, it's Jalisco, this is mm -hmm. my turf. So he ordered the Chapitos freed. So they had to free them and then they freed his son inside prison, right? And that's how they that's how they literally declare war against each other. Wow. Los Chapitos against Damaso. Mm -hmm. Los Chapitos eventually managed to get a lot of like more power and overpower the Damasos. And Damaso was arrested in Mexico City. Damaso dad, uh, El Licenciado, mm -hmm. was arrested in Mexico City. What year was he arrested? Uh, I think it was 2017. Okay. And then months after, uh, Mini Leak uh, couldn't hold the, you know, the his his turf. Right. So he ha he went for the border in Calexico and turned himself over to the DEA. He has been talking with the DEA for a while now and he had been like planning on turning himself over so he can, you know, give information against Los Chapitos. And now he's the main guy behind the hunt against Los Chapitos. Cause he went, he served for five years. They released him, he's free. He's not under WITSEC, he's not under uh, uh, witness protection or whatever. It's just the main source of information. He's not under witness protection at all? No, he's not. They're protecting him, the DEA is protecting him. The DEA guy, is protecting him. But he's not, he never signed as a WITSEC. He's not signed in as a WITSEC. How much protection could you possibly get from the DEA? <clears throat> not sure, man, not sure. But, but when I met him, I could tell that there, there were a couple of agents around the place we met oh really so they're yeah they're putting an eye on him to so okay explain to me how this interview came about <clears throat> what like did he reach out to you out of the blue or how did this happen yes he reached out to me through instagram first he sent me a dm and of course i'm like yeah dude i mean i get reached out by these amount of career your dms must be insane they're fucking wild man they're fucking wild i mean Every, probably I get, what, like five, 10 messages a request every single hour of people saying everything from threats, from help me, I have a, a family disappear, whatever, uh, to advise, hey man, I'm traveling to Mexico, is it safe to go to this resort in Cancun, whatever, right. to, hey, I'm El Mayo. Hey, I'm talking to you on behalf of this crazy secret organization in the U.S. that you never heard of, and we, we're gonna kill you. To there is a bounty on your head. To watch out, I'm a U.S. official, and I know that this is happening. To this is a new software criminals are using. I'm part of it called Titan. We'll get into it later. The, these leads all come in through your Most DMs. Most of the leads come. Most through, of them. Yes. Do. How do you filter out which ones are legit or not? Do you do you actually go through them all? 
No, no I imagine no, no. it's got to be hard no, to keep dude. your sanity, yeah, bro. No, no, no. I mean, I, there's, there's no fucking way I can go th through it all. Um, what I usually do is when I think there could be a story, I go and try to vet the information and the people behind it. If that person is not willing to turn on his video camera to share IDs, to share like kind of like that kind of shit, I just drop it. I, I literally drop it. Right. Uh, if, 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 if someone tell me, even if it sounds like good info, most of the guys with good info, they will do, they will follow, they, they will just like- They'll show you Yeah, they'll like, let's move to a proof. secure app. I, I have a couple of secure apps. And let's move to that, open an account on these on these several secure apps, whatever. And um, turn on your camera so I can know you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can meet, because you know my face, you know my name, you all you know all about me, but I don't know who's behind that account. So right. it's only fair right. to be on a neutral space. Yep. I know how to take care of your side of things so you don't get backlash or whatever. I'm not going to record anything. We're just going to talk first, right? I need to understand who are you? Why are you bringing this information to me? What are your motivations? What do you want for it? What kind of information is this? I, I waste a lot of time with kind of like fake, weak leads, right? But sometimes it works because because you get some strong fucking leads, you know. So sometimes it's just nothing, old news, something that it's just rumors, something like I know a guy who knows a guy who has a cousin that blah blah blah. Right. Um, how do you vet, or how do you what what you, like red flags do you look for when you're vetting some of these people that are messaging you, that, like that's, to determine whether they have some sort of ulterior ulterior agenda or motive, or might just be like a one faction of one, one cartel that wants to like attack another faction or paint another faction in a bad light or first red flag is when they say it's just for the sake of truth just for the sake of you know everybody has an agenda dude mm -hmm. like everyone especially right. they reach out to someone who's about to publish something so yeah so most of these guys are are because I I speak with a lot of honesty. Like that's what I do. I talk about my ways of doing it. I'm very honest on saying like it's probably nothing. I'm probably not even gonna publish this shit or mm -hmm. just stop and don't tell me shit because I don't want to know about that stuff. Mm -hmm. Or just like hey dude, I'm gonna have to if you bring this information to me, I'm gonna have to bet this through U.S. and Mexican officials. If you're good with it, I mean I'm, I'm gonna try to protect your identity and everything but with this info i might have to bet it through these people to see if they know something to blah, 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 blah. so i'm super honest about my process right mm -hmm. and when the person behind that account is honest as well and is like talking to me on video whatever and say like you know what you know why i'm bringing this to you because i want to retire and i want to fuck these guys over and that's it or they did me wrong and i want to fuck them or i just think this is overstepping uh, you know the the my morals or my you know things and this is this is something that I don't want to be involved into but I got this info so I'm just handing it over to you and do what you got to do, what I got to do. Mm -hmm. or yes I'm a member of the faction against those guys so those guys are a, a fucker like the like Damaso himself when he reached out he said like hey man I'm I'm Damaso mini leak uh, I I had uploaded a couple of videos about him because he was uh, recently freed. So I uploaded a, a, a video saying that he was free. And we, we have the video that he originally sent you? <clears throat> no, no, oh, no, okay. no, no, no. The videos that I that I posted on my YouTube talking oh, about gotcha. him, right? Okay. First, right. like saying like, hey, so Damaso was freed. This is this guy. This is what he did. This is blah, 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 blah. This is what he was going to say. Like debriefing what, okay. who it was Damaso, right? And then he, I, I got reached out. And he's like, I'm reaching out to you, first of all, because... You talk a lot of sh bullshit, but most of that bullshit is not necessarily lies. So I just want to set the record straight for you. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't know if that's a compliment or what, mm -hmm. but if you are really who you say you are, let's move to a secure app and turn on your camera. I'm pretty sure that I can recognize your face. So he did. <clears throat> he turned on his camera and he had this hat on and he was in selfie mode. And I was like, can you move your hat a bit up you know so i can see your face and i saw his face and it was him and i was like oh shit so it's really you and it's like yeah and i'm like dude you look older <laughs> and he's just laughing it's like yeah you look more f fucked up too on camera <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like thank you dude so so yeah i mean can you show me your id passport something that, yeah. says, that has your name mm -hmm. mm, yeah i mean i don't have to but I'll, I'll do it for you so he shows his id whatever 
And then we kept talking. We uh, turned off the camera, kept talking for a while. So I'm like, dude, I'm very interested in an interview with you, but I'm pretty sure that you're reaching out with an agenda, right? Like, what is it? And he was very clear about it. He's mm -hmm. like, I just want to fuck the Chapitos over. So I just want to talk a lot of shit I know about them and how things really went. And yeah, that's, I mean, I'm being transparent on yep. my intentions. Yep. And I'm like, okay, so that those are your intentions. On my intentions, the inten the um I don't want to fuck anyone. I don't. I couldn't give a shit about like fucking los chapitos or whatever. I just want to interview with you, and that's the main thing. I'm interesting. Can we agree on the middle ground where I'm when I'm gonna make an interview with you, but I'm not gonna talk shit about these guys any unproven unproven shit. And he's like, no, I have proof of what I'm gonna tell you. And okay, so perfect. So we agreed on on meeting right in person. In person, yes. Uh, so I flew to LA. He was not living in LA. He was living somewhere else. So he traveled by land uh, to so LA. You weren't really concerned about meeting with him because he'd already done his present time. He was a free man. Like he, he had no reason to fuck with you. Even though, I'm, uh, I mean, you never know. So yes, you I still mean, never know. Yeah. So I was absolutely. Yeah, I was. I was kind of like concerned about that. But I was like, fuck it, dude. I'll, I'll just do it. You know. I flew to LA. He uh, asked me to be in certain hotel. To uh, have a whole protocol when I travel to meet people, you know, uh, a whole protocol that I'm, of course, I'm not going to disclose in detail. But there's a whole protocol to. Do you have people that go there for you in advance to scope out the location? Like, no. uh, like a lot of people, like I know presidents when they go and visit places for meetings or presidential candidate candidates they have what's called an advanced team mm -hmm. where they go like if they're meeting in a hotel they'll have a team of guys that like walk through the hotel yeah. talk to people and like no i i i don't like i i work on, on a way more simple you know protocol yeah. mm -hmm. uh p part of it i can say probably part of it it's just either arriving way earlier day or two days or three days or even a week earlier or a week later, you know, and say like, sorry, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I yeah, right. that, that's part of it. Like, yeah, so so it's, it's a whole protocol I have that has worked for me to make me feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> even choosing the, I just uh, asked, because he, he said the place, but I asked to choose my own room and book my own thing. So like, okay, you, you want me to be in this hotel particularly, I'll be there. But let like me handle the whole fucking thing of my arrangement of flights, transport, hotel room, all that shit. Because he's like, I can I can put you in that hotel, whatever. That. Like, no, I I don't need you to do that for me. Just set a place, and I'll handle the whole fucking thing, right? So he set the place, set the date, and I so I requested a certain room where I feel safe, where it has like certain you know ways of exit and blah 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 security protocols on on a room. And um, and yeah, I I waited, and he showed up at the agreed time, and and he was very normal. He was like just like a regular dude you meet and say like, hey, what's up? Are you armed when you go do this? In on the U.S. side of of the border, most of the times I'm not, but sometimes I am. Uh -huh. Sometimes I am in Mexico, no, uh -huh. but in Mexico, when I feel this is the thing, my. The simplest thing about a security protocol, protocol is that if you feel you're gonna, you have a chance to die, like a real chance, like a real threat, just don't fucking go, right? right. So it doesn't worth it. Right. So that's the that's the simplest thing. It's like okay, so I feel a real threat. Mm -hmm. I, I something is off. Mm -hmm. They're asking me to travel to mm -hmm. this place to meet these guys. To blah, 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 blah. Nah, I'll just pass on it, even if it's. You hear that? Yeah. Do you hear that sound, Steve? It's the coyotes. It's the coyotes. Oh, it's that. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so that's what I do when I feel like okay, I might, I might go. Uh, in Mexico, depending on who I'm meeting, if it's like a middleman, a middle range, whatever, yeah. uh, I I do have a bunch of contacts in Mexico that I just ask them like, hey, can you watch over me? Mm, that's a good. Uh, that's they're, a good yeah, yeah, they're like super, super legit in terms of they, they won't say shit right? right they won't say who i made where i made nothing right. i trust them enough and they trust me enough but they are heavily armed but trained people you know right. like good good like heavyweight guys yeah like a paramilitary guy or yeah. on this side and like a fucking navy disc, seal or yeah something. <laughs> they're super discreet they're yeah. around like regular people whatever but right. i'm like yeah can you help me out on this one boom if i need them to show up like 
you know, like proper geared up and whatever, then I ask them like, yeah, you can show up like geared up and whatever. They will show like, like mm-hmm. basically security escorts and right. you know, like that kind of shit. When, especially when it, when it's a bar, when it's a public bar, crowded with people and you know, like a club or whatever, and they someone wants to meet there for a reason, I ask them to f- to go like f- fully, you know, like hey, really, can, yeah, like can you help me out and let's why just- at a bar would you want them to look like that? Because <clears throat> you show. You show that you're with people, right? You show you, that you were with security, and so they're basically bodyguards, and you want them to 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 know that you have bodyguards. Because okay. when you when you put into the mix alcohol and shit, mm, right, then things can go mm. off fast. Uh, this is that's the other thing. Like I've been reached out recently by a source that he's slow, dude. Like probably one of the biggest interviews I've ever I could ever uh, do eventually if. But this dude is always wasted dude like shit faced so i'm always trying to let him know like dude okay call me tomorrow when you feel better right because i don't deal with people that are under the influence right. of anything because yeah you need a clear mind and 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 also i need respect you know for like dude I'm, I'm giving you respect i'm a journalist this is my job i'm being a professional we're not friends we're not you know uh, this is not a social gathering mm. this is work for me and i'm I'm taking time from my family, from whatever, my work, whatever, to give you time. And I appreciate you giving me time for this. But I need also respect from your end. You can call me all shit-facing, like, hey, I'm this and that, blah, blah, blah. Even if your info is great, I'll rather pass on it because mm-hmm. that's not the way I work. Right. Pardon this brief interruption, but I want to take a second to talk about our sponsor, Verso. Now, if you've heard this podcast before, chances are you already know how obsessed I am with health and longevity, which is why one of my favorite guests to have on the show is nutritional scientist and neuroscientist, Dr. Dom D'Agostino, who actually introduced me to this stuff. Verso is a company that is dedicated to translating scientific breakthroughs into products that hold the potential to increase longevity. The problem with aging is we accumulate these zombie cells or old damaged cells that linger beyond their useful life. These zombie cells infect other healthy cells, speeding up the aging process, causing things like hair loss, wrinkles, arthritis, cancer, dementia, and everything in the realm of aging. What scientists have realized is that we can manually induce autophagy, meaning the cleanup process of the old zombie cells and replacing them with new ones. Verso's new clean being, which I take every night, is a powerful blend of senolytic molecules that help promote the body's natural cleanup processes like autophagy and apoptosis, promoting better cellular health, supporting lower inflammation and natural cardioprotective functions, while boosting protection against age-related diseases. The three main ingredients in clean being are spermidine, lutolin, and dehydrocorsetin, which play key roles in the control of gene expression and are essential for cell growth and proliferation. Specifically, when it comes to cardiovascular and cognitive function, skin health, vision, and the immune system. Head on over to ver.so and use the coupon code DANNY, it's spelled D-A-N-N-Y, to save 15% off your entire order or just go to ver.so forward slash Danny. Back to the show. Damas was very serious, right? He was like cleaned, serious. Uh, he agreed How old is he? He's uh, 37. So. 37. Oh, oh. Yeah, if, if I would have met with him in the hotel, I would imagine like my first reaction would be like, we got to meet in the lobby or like at the in the restaurant at the hotel or something. This is the thing. I I requested for a room with a window to the street where I knew he was coming. I asked him to show up, right, at a certain time. Well, he asked me to to meet him at a certain time, and I'm like, I'm going to I'm going to meet you upstairs. I'm going to meet you in this room. But I changed the plan. So I met him on the street, right? When I when I was looking over the room, I saw a couple of DA agents around because oh, you can tell really? they're like you know on cargo pants, these Oakley glasses. <laughs> really? So they kind of like scouted the place, blah blah blah, and then he showed up. He pulled over on a, on a black SUV. So he had the DEA as like an advanced team for himself. I think he didn't had the DEA. I think the DEA was like just following him. Yeah, following him. So I'm like, okay, he's moving. Apparently, he's gonna go into this hotel for some reason. Uh, so boom, they kind of like went and say like, okay, let's let's wow, see what happens. Bro. You're doing like legitimate spycraft when it's you're preparing for these crazy interviews. fucking it's shit. Dude. And and then I saw him arrive, and before he pulled out, I was already in the street. Right, I was already out in the street. So I greeted him. He kind of like surprised him. Like I opened his door, he came out, and he was like, hey, cómo estás, compadre? Hey, dude, how you doing? 
And I'm like, hey, dude, all good. Um, so what's up? It's like, hey, you want to jump in and probably have a drive and grab something to eat, whatever, before we're going to. Um, and first I was like, ah, probably not. Not the best idea. But I kind of like felt that he was pushing a bit for it. So I was like, okay, okay. So, okay, I'll, I'll follow through. Yes, let's, 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 let's go. So I jumped into the back of his car black car tinted windows who was driving one of his guys uh, I, I didn't i Did didn't he have a lot of money dude here yeah man like yes like a lot of fucking money yeah like his own driver full-time driver kind of money okay. this guy from uh, sinaloa an accent young kid yeah. i thought he was a family member or something like that he was like every like quiet with a bunch of like cash money on his fanny backpack you know and a cap driving around and what what are you laughing at <laughs> he had a fanny pack full yeah, of cash yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah bro because <laughs> this, this guy mini leak was not able because of his um because of the condition legal condition he's not able to meet journalists family members criminal members or former criminals or handle money right mm. he needs to use a a, a pre-approved debit card where the dea you know, allows him to allow him to keep some of his money, but of course, what else is gonna do? So he has a bunch of cash, right? But he's not handling. His other guy mm -hmm. is handling the, the cash. What kind of car is he driving? I can say. I okay. mean, probably, okay. yeah, I can say. And we went. I, I, I do. I can say we're, that we went to have uh, pancakes. It was pancakes. surreal, dude. You go to Waffle House or our, <laughs> yes. our IHOP. Waffle House, <laughs> sitting with fucking this former leader of the Sinaloa cartel <laughs> and his henchman or whatever who was, he was, he called him secretary. So he's with his secretary <clears throat> and a fucking Waffle House wow. having <laughs> blueberry pancakes. Oh my God. Well, it wasn't pancakes. Waffle House doesn't have pancakes, I don't think. It's only or waffles. Waffles, yes. No fucking way, dude. And uh, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yes, I mean, I'll, some other people showed up I can say whatever uh -huh. and then we went back into the into a hotel room I was like so you're ready like do you feel cute to go back into the hotel and then start a, an interview and he's like yeah did you feel pretty good about did you have like build a rapport with him during when you guys were eating yes, waffles yes yes you yes pretty confident yeah dude like, what, I want, what I want to do with every single source is first that they know that they have my respect mm -hmm. that I'm not judging yeah. that I, I'm not you right. know anyone to judge whatever they do whatever they right. want to say what, what i don't give a shit uh they're fucking humans so i can't i try to find a common and relatable ground mm -hmm. right some something even if it's a sport or a, a color or music or something we have in common so we can start like doing small talk and, and relate relate to each other, right? Mm -hmm. So we can find common ground. Right. Right before going into full a lot of the journalists what they do is they go into full journalist mode and just dump a bunch of questions. Right. right, right. They're like, so how do you start it? Blah blah blah, baby bam, this and that. Tell me this, tell me that, tell me boom. Yeah. I'm not easy on them because I, I question Damaso really mm -hmm. hard on the accusations of him killing a journalist, probably the last brave journalist in Mexico, Javier Valdez. He was a fucking legend, dude. He was an inspiration for all of us. And he is accused, formally accused, of killing Javier Valdez. Who accused him? The Mexican government. That the Mexican government is asking uh, the US government to deport Damaso so he can face jail in Mexico for the killing of Javier Valdez. Hmm. So this is not, not only an issue of cartel, this is a binational political issue between the two countries. <clears throat> Does the Mexican government really care, or do you think it's the fucking a uh, proxy cartel within the government trying to get him exactly. whacked? Exactly, that is what it is. That's exactly what it is. Anyways, I question his version of him not killing Javier Valdez, and he said it was Los Chapitos. So how long? Okay, so let's go. Let's do it. Um, so okay, after so, after you guys had uh, breakfast, or so we went pancakes, back to the hotel. Back to the hotel, and then what? Like, and then we. How sat. did it go? Did the guy come with you, or did you guys go alone? No, no, we, we came all together. Okay. Up. I, okay. I, I had the room already set up, you know, okay. uh, no personal, uh, like my backpack was literally ready to go right next to the door in case something, you know, whatever. Um, we came up, he sat on a, on a chair 
and his other dude sat on the other on the other side of looking towards the door and i literally sat on the floor he was like you wanna there was another chair or whatever no i'm like i'm feel comfortable sitting on the floor just to make just to make a statement that i'm cool you know i'm not i'm not feeling threatened so we we can all relax and be cool and i sat on the floor and we start i start talking sort of like so dude like this is probably the first and last time i'm gonna uh, talk to you so do you have enough time and it's like dude i don't have anything else to do but sit in my fucking house so by all means so this interview lasts like for probably probably like 12 hours 11 nice. 12 hours we kept talking we ordered food we kept talking and talking and talking i first wanted to get out of the fucking room the whole journalist thing right javier valdez so one of my first questions you was like started with that i started with like how, how do you feel what are you doing now what is your what is your legal situation right now what is happening with your dad is still is still behind bars are you comfortable saying openly saying that you are um co cooperating with the u.s authorities to go against los chapitos um i explained what my plans were to publish right it's like this is not going to be a bi biography or some shit like that i'm going to push back into you, what you say and lay out what i feel is the truth and your impressions he only said like i hope you're not too harsh on me and i'm like well let's see man let's let's see how the text goes i'm not gonna be particularly harsh on you it's just the way i write it's 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 try, i'm trying to be ob as objective as i can right mm -hmm. so uh, so i want to get uh read of the the white elephant in the room mm -hmm. javier valdez and he's like okay let me tell you and i'm like okay before you tell me i, I shouldn't tell you that one of my biggest fears right now is to be sitting across someone who killed a journalist <laughs> right because if you kill a journalist then you're basically a, th a direct threat to me as a journalist as well so i don't want to be in the middle of that so if you if you come true and you say the truth and you say you know what yes I, I was involved i'm not gonna be judgy but i'm probably gonna call this interview off and and just leave man i can't do this like that and if you even if i feel you're not telling the truth i also might take everything else you say for untrue right so let's get rid of that shit. I'm being honest with you. I'm being clear. I'm risking myself a bit too to be here. I'm I'm being like good to you. So let's let's talk uh, con los huevos, no? Let's let's mm -hmm. talk like with balls. And uh, and yeah, I mean, he's started laying out his version that is out on on the story. He said basically that he wasn't him, that it was los chapitos. <clears throat> because of the of an interview they po the uh, Javier Valdez published with Damaso, um, he published an he uh, yeah when they were at war Damaso reached out to Javier Valdez to this journalist and he said like hey man I want to give you an exclusive interview with me and my dad telling you what is happening right now in Sinaloa within the Sinaloa cartel Javier Valdez said okay let's do it he uh, he did an interview with both of them and he published the interview. And when he was about to publish the interview, Los Chapitos somehow learned that he had interviewed Damaso. So they asked him, like, hey, man, how much money do you want for not to publish that story? He said, this is not a money thing. We're going to publish, we're going to run the story. And then he called his, uh, the director, the owner of the newspaper, and said, like, hey, I want to buy you that interview. How much money do you guys want? And they say, nope, we're going to run the story. So they published the story, and Los Chapitos sent all of their henchmen to to basically get all the newspapers distributed in the, in the whole state so no one could read that story so they they and they burned the whole fucking yeah so they they wow. stopped the, the delivery pickup trucks whatever and then phew, they burned the whole fucking thing then they published the story again is this verifiable they, they yeah, 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 yeah yeah everything is everything is it's it's uh it's a it's a very version of, of that happening even the uh, director of the news uh paper published uh the, the whole fuck his this version on the website right so before that i mean after that uh they they published the story again on the next on the next uh, uh printed version right and they posted it online that's when they that's when they killed uh javier valdez Right, uh, but but <clears throat> right after the interview, Javier Valdez also published an OPD calling Damaso 
a shitty fucking henchman for the Sinaloa cartel uh, that he had no decision uh, making capabilities and he was like dumb and you know kind of, kind of like trashing Minilik mm. so after that after they published those couple of stories he got killed right uh, in front of the newspaper Damaso says he was killed by Los Chapitos because he 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 published that interview but Los Chapitos said it was Damaso because he kind of like insulted him mm. What Damas says is like, imagine if I go killing every guy who who is insulting me. I mean, it was gonna be fucking bloodshed all over. I'm, I can't take I can't take an insult, you know. What does your gut tell you? My gut tell me that is uh, that he that he that he was Los Chapitos, man. I mean, it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense that that you know what? What I think is what really killed Javier Valdez is. The impunity that is in Mexico. He, a journalist in the U.S. will never face that faith. Even if you're giving an interview here, getting into there, you publish some shit like blah, blah, blah. There, a journalist should never face the questioning on who was, who was the one who killed me. What got him at the end is that he got in the middle of a fucking war of factions. Mm. And that he didn't have no protection by the, the authorities, right? That right. the whole fucking state is run over by these guys. So whoever killed him, whoever of these two factions killed him, they shouldn't have been able to reach out to him in that way, right? To threaten him, to kill him, if if the Mexican government will do his job, right? right? right. So either way, my gut says it was probably them because they, they, they show that they didn't want that story published. Mm -hmm. But I'm not putting my hands for Damaso because he could easily be Damaso. He had a lot of power. Uh, he, of course, is a man capable of killing people, right? Mm. So I'm not putting my hands to fire for, for his version. Um, this is what he says. I still haven't had a, a an interview with any of those chapitos to hear their version, right? Hopefully one day I can, I can bring the other version, their more, version. More journalists die in Mexico than anywhere in the world. Though, than right? anywhere in the world outside of a war zone, yeah. Outside of what? O a war zone. A war zone, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So what else did you get out of that interview with him during that 12 hours? <clears throat> so basically, we got rid of that shit, and then he started telling me how he became part of the organization, the, his whole uh, dad story, how he grew up, and how he didn't want to be part of the cartel. He's like, dude, I wanted to be a pilot. Um, so I wanted to study for for pilot. I started like my, my the school, whatever. But in order to be a pilot in Mexico, you need to go to uh, at the at the end you need to go to the uh, through the Mexican military to get a permit uh, to fly. Uh, so he's like, okay, I approve all my uh, tests and exams, whatever, whatever. I showed up to my dad. Uh, it was about eighteen, and he's like, dude, I need my uh, credentials from the Mexican military. I'm gonna show up to the military zone here in Tinaloa, whatever, to ask for my card. And he's like, the fuck, you're not going to do that, dude. Like, that's too risky. No, find another fucking thing to do. And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, dude, you have my my, own, my same name. The government is all after me. They're going to be after you or they're going to take you in order to get me. So no, find another thing to do. <laughs> so he's like, what else? And he's like, just set up a business. And he's like, okay. So I started setting up a business. And then my dad said like, okay, but you're not going to run that business, right? You're going to have a front man running that business for you. And he's like, no, dude, the whole fucking thing of doing a business is to run a business. He wanted to get his hands dirty. Yeah. And no, he was like, no, dude, like, if you do that, you're risking yourself. You're putting yourself out there too much. They don't. If you want to have a business, I can give you the money, put the business, but have a frontman run run from you for you. And he's like, nah, it doesn't make sense. He doesn't want to just be an investor. He wants to actually do something. Do something. And then his thought was like, then, then he was like, okay, so... Then you want me basically to become a fucking trafficker. And it's like, fuck no. And it's like, dude, there is like you don't let me do anything. I want to do something. So yeah, let me let me move some bricks. And it's like, all right, if you want to do that, that's that's how you. So he gave him a couple of bricks. He he told he told me that he sold the bricks, he came back home, and his dad asked him, like, how much money have you made in, on them? And he's like, uh, I don't know, let's say they he paid ten thousand for the bricks, sold them, came back, how much money you made on it? And he's like, ten thousand. It's like, what do you mean 10,000? 10,000 on top of the 10,000? It's like, oh, 10,000. And he's like, dude, the whole fucking business is supposed to be made for you to make money, dude. That's how they No one explained yeah. to him how the economics of <laughs> buying and selling works. Exactly, dude. 
So he's like, okay. So then he started learning how to do that shit, right? How to sell bricks and and how to yeah. He was uh, eventually in charge of moving large quantities of cocaine and shit in Sinaloa, and then handling the money, and then blah blah blah. And then he like kind of like kept stepping up mm. until the war between the factions uh, broke loose. Um, what is Damaso's relation? Does he have a relationship or does he have any communication lines open with El Chapo? No, he said not anymore. He, not anymore. He said he was he was he said like at the beginning I, of course I felt bad, but cuz El Chapo was my godfather and right. when he escaped, we gave him we lent him our houses and we were in charge of his security, so he was around. And when they killed El Chapo's son in 2016, I think uh, Edgar they killed his son. They killed his son, dude. Like, Which one of his sons? Like an Edgar. He was the youngest. Oh fuck! I didn't even realize that. <clears throat> Edgar Guzman. He was killed uh, allegedly by mistake because the by same who? by the by another guy, but by this by his same organization. They thought there was, they thought he was part of the Beltran Leyva's uh, rival faction, the Sinaloa cartel, but it was allegedly his own same organization who killed him by mistake, and, and he was best friends with Damaso. They were they were best friends like since kids. Um, Damaso says that he's still very heartfelt for what happened. He's like I was supposed to be with him that night, but I got a call from a girl, so I went into her house, and when I'm taking a shower to go to him, they call me and say like, "Hey, dude, they killed Edgar." Um, and he's like, "Dude, that broke my heart. He was my best friend in the fucking world." So whenever I met El Chapo. El Chapo would ask me, like, how was Edgar? Did, what kind of girls he liked? And he, he was, he kind of like replaced Edgar with me. So mm. <clears throat> so when I got married, when, I, when every birthday and stuff, El Chapo would show up to my parties, but he wouldn't show up to his son's parties, his son's own own uh, weddings or birthday parties or whatever. Like Ovidio? Like guys? Ovidio, Ivan Archivaldo, Alfredo, he wouldn't show up to, to them but he will show up for Damasos, right? So they started getting jealous. Like, why the fuck are you, uh, is our dad showing up to every single one of your fucking parties? It's not showing up to us. Yeah. Um, so he was, he felt like <clears throat> he was in the head of El Chapo. He was like another kid. But then he's like, Oh, I asked him, like, was it hard to testify against El Chapo on his trial? Like to point him and say like, yeah, this is the man. And it's like no, dude. Because at the end, he sent uh, a letter to los, to his sons saying that I'm gonna find the fucking rat who's riding on you guys, and uh, and I'm gonna have him killed. So he's like, okay. So he's after me. Um, I'm I'm just gonna go after him. Fuck it. So wow. he went. So yeah. He's like, I don't feel bad about it. Like fuck it. This is the name of the game. He's uh, it's either his life or mine. So it's gonna be his, right? And and I'm like, dude, how comfortable you feel telling that you are sharing all the information the u.s has against los chapitos and he's like dude that's that's what i'm that's my fucking plan that's my goal in life right now to have him either killed or arrested and i and it's like he, he told me like i swear to you that i'm gonna see the four of them here the three of them here uh the four of them sorry here in the u.s that was before ovidi was uh extradited right right <clears throat> and after this interview got published Oh, who reached out to you? So this is the thing. The, the interview got published uh, on on crashoutmedia.com. Uh, sorry for the advertisement. <laughs> this is the, no, it's uh, 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 Substack, we're managing uh, e e um, Yohan Grillo and mm -hmm. myself. We're kind of like partnering to publish exclusive stories there. And the story went huge, right? Especially in Mexico. Before, quick aside before you published it or before you even interviewed him, did you reach out to some of the big like media outlets that you typically work with? Not before interviewing him. Okay. Like, after interviewing him, after I recorded the whole fucking, I, I recorded the whole interview uh, with proper podcast microphones and shit. Like mm -hmm. I, I got a gear and I have a full, it's not, it's not the whole hours, of course. It's, uh, it's about a three hours interview. Wow, you edited 12 into three? <laughs> I didn't record everything. Okay. I yeah, there was no fucking way I could right. have enough space to record everything, <laughs> right? So I I did take notes on everything, mm -hmm. on everything, everything. I have like huge notepad on notes, mm -hmm. and I, but I have three good um, hours of audio of that interview, 
Um, but then, okay, so <clears throat> I didn't reach out to anyone um, probably after a month after the interview because I was planning on how how I'm going to publish it. Is it worth it? What scenarios I'm going I'm going to face? What backlash can I get from that? Uh, the legal side of it as well, you know, like the ho the, the whole fucking thing. So it took mm -hmm. me a month before traveling. I also was dealing with another set of stories hard reported stories you know so complicated so i need like free space um when i when i have some stories like these sometimes like that for probably two weeks i went out of my home to to my parents to live on one of the rooms and to just stay there and think right try to focus and think what i'm about what am i about to do and is it worth it and how to package this story and who I'm going right. to pitch it to right. and, and, and just dumb the whole fucking thing, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and then when I had something together, I reached out to, uh, to uh, Rolling Stone first. Um, they said they were interested. They were like, yeah, fuck yes, we're definitely interested. This is the godson of El Chapo speaking for the first time ever. So this is, this is massive. During a hunt for Los Chapitos, right? So this is a great exclusive right. shit. Um, but then they took a fucking week or two weeks to get back at me with, with, uh, with something. I asked them like, okay, so what's the rate and how many words and, you know, like the details usually you ask after a pitch, uh, I, 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 do you have a deadline whatever? They didn't answer for two full weeks and they, they got back to me at, with a question saying like how competitive this is. And I was like, dude, if you're asking me that question, mm -hmm. then pfft, I'm just probably gonna waste my fucking exclusive story on a magazine that it's just gonna put it on the back end of a magazine and it's not gonna <sighs> package it well, right? I was really disappointed at um, at Rolling Stone because I, I I have high regards for that magazine. I mean, it's a great fucking magazine. They publish great fucking stories, but uh, but I didn't feel comfortable after that. I was like, nah. They also have another huge story of mine that has been sitting there for over a year, and it's a and it's a huge also exclusive shit. And they, this was an assignment they did to me in February, and it's almost a fucking year, and I haven't heard back. Not even about a kill fee, not even about edits, nothing. They just let my story sit there, and they stopped answer answering. They did a couple of like three months ago. They did reach the back. When, when, no, when I reached with that story with that pitch, I also asked for that other story. Like, hey, but what happened with that other story? You mm -hmm. were sitting on it. And they're like, no, no, we're gonna actually pay you better because this is gonna be on the print new and the print magazine. So we're trying to find the right moment right. to publish it. But it's like, yeah, dude, for a freelancer to sit on a fucking story for a year mm -hmm. before, and then you get paid thirty days net later, like after publishing it, you're you're you can kill journalists like that. You could. This kill is the problem years. with these legacy media outlets and and these big publications. That, that you know, th this is the reason for the uprise of independent journalism. And that's why people like you, everyone need, that's watching, needs to go to Luis's channel, subscribe. You guys, you you have Substack, yeah. you have a YouTube channel. Yeah. What else do you have? And and it's uh, my Instagram, which is the and probably, your Instagram. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have yeah. Patreon or anything? Or um, no, I don't. I don't. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to keep everything on on on, on YouTube and Substack. YouTube and Substack, you know? and, Substack. and yeah. then it'll obviously be linked below. Um, yeah, dude. So yeah, I was really disappointed because that that can kill a fucking career. And 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 I was like, dude, I why do I feel uh kind of like mistreated by a magazine right. with this information, with these right. fucking story I have in my hands, right. right? I shouldn't feel like that. So I decided just to move it and to pitch it to the guys who I work more regularly for. I, I, I actually have a retainer with them, uh, with Vice News. Oh, yeah. So I pulled to my to my editor, uh, but at the moment, Vice was going through the whole bankruptcy thing, so they didn't have the capability to move it into... I was like, these guys are not... When did they go bankrupt? Um, on uh, January this year. Really? I Can you find no. that, Steve? I didn't even hear about this. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's, that's where the whole conversation started. But then, then probably like three, four months ago, mm -hmm. five months ago, they 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 publicly went bankrupt. Uh, so it was a uh, it was a uh, oh in May. May that's 15th, when they, yeah. 2023, Vice Media Group filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Protection in the Southern District of Texas. The company's bankruptcy cases are jointly administered at... Whoa. Dude, they've been... They've been I remember, led. like, fucking eight years ago, eight, seven years ago, I, you would see articles coming out every month about how Vice is worth upwards of a $2 billion. <laughs> yes, 
Consort, what does that say? Consortium led by Fortress Investment Group for $350 million. Oh, Vice agreed to be inquir- acquired by. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, according to Vice, the bankruptcy process will strengthen the company and position for... It was basically acquired by the main uh, the main money lenders, right? They, they, they were the main investors, so they basically just owned the company. They own it now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because Rupert Murdoch and Disney... Disney, they all, they all had stocks... They oh. all owned a, uh, a significant portion of that. Yeah, you met. You actually hung out with Shane Smith. Didn't yeah, you? dude. I started. I started writing for Vice News as a freelance uh, ten years ago. So I mean, I, I met. Uh, I met. That's when it was really Vice, dude. Yes, I mean when it started, dude. It was. It was wild. It was. They will. They. They were. They were great at packaging shit and doing stories that you can't publish anywhere. So they, they were good. But they lacked the proper journalistic ethics and, yeah, the proper journalistic view of it, right? Like, what is news and what is just not news and how to handle a news story, right? Ethically, how to handle ethically and professionally. In the beginning, it wasn't news, though. It wasn't news. It was just like they would go into fucking war zones or go into some crazy fucking place and just turn their cameras on yeah. and start fucking talking to people. Yeah. And then they'd come up, you know, like like heavy metal in Baghdad. Yeah. The fucking documentary is insane. Mm-hmm. And 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 um, Chirac, yeah. the noisy thing yeah. where they they're, where they're in Chicago and they're fucking in the inner cities of Chicago, like with all the musicians and shit. Like it's fucking insane Dude, what they that, would do. That that was the great fucking thing about Vice. That was news because that was that was like on the reported stories, right? And there were they they had. We had meetings before reporting on all that shit. Like it was, it was like it wasn't. There was an editorial thing behind it, but there were not like proper editors and shit back then. Mm-hmm. When they when they came out with Vice News, they hired for what I think it's the best of the best in the fucking industry, right? The best fucking editors, the best fucking directors, a lot of like great, great fucking journalists, video journalists, mm-hmm. and and you know like they they had like a great fucking team where they put together Vice News. Still to this day, dude. Like I mean, they they've been letting go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of journalists in in, in Vice News. Sadly, mm-hmm. great people. Uh, like like my good friend uh, Keegan Hamilton. He's fucking a, a badass man. David Noriega, dude, covering Latin America. Who's like great emily green she is like the top fucking reporter when it comes uh to immigration stories mm-hmm. solid fucking people so they're letting everyone go right um and 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 and, and, and don't get me wrong i mean vice still has like some like of the greatest fucking editors and 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 and, and editorial directors in within within vice that they're like holding positions even through the whole fucking mess right now. So when I when I pitched this story, Vice was going through the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. So it was hard to think that they will have the mind to take and properly wrap this story, right? I was like, I don't know, dude. Like, am I gonna pitch this story and I'm gonna see this forever, or I'm gonna pitch this story and then they're gonna fucking kick me in the ass because they're bankrupt right now, and I'm not gonna even get paid. I'm just gonna get fired. Right. And then I'm gonna feel like shit afterwards. They're really um, honest people, and I really appreciate that about Vice. Or, or at least on, on my uh, editorial team, like my mm-hmm. editors and shit. So I spoke to uh, to my editor um, Deb Robinello uh, about this, and she's like, "Dude, it's your, I mean, we would love to have your story, and we're probably gonna try to make it work and look good, but it's your it's your call, right? So I understand where you're coming from and how you feel about Vice right now. So it's your call." Uh, I decided to to make a statement and say uh, and call Grill and say like, hey, dude, why don't we fucking join forces and publish this on our own on our own fucking thing mm-hmm. <clears throat> on your Softic account, link to my Softic account, yeah, and we'll do uh, an interview like you interview me on my YouTube channel about like the behind the scenes of the whole fucking thing of Damaso's uh, story, right? And of course, it was like extremely like cool with this. Like, fuck yes, dude! I'm gonna treat this with respect and and shit. Uh, let's see if we make money out of it. Um, I did. I mean, of course, nothing, nothing huge, but some. Com- is it comparable to what you would get got paid by Rolling Stone or Vice? Or it, dep- it really depends on the story. Yeah. But let's say the range for a simple 
600 word tapping story, right? Like one of these stories you can tap within an hour. You make a couple of calls, 600 words. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get between 600 and 800 bucks mm -hmm. per, per one of these stories, right? Um, if it's a more complex, complicated, whatever, you can get 2,000, 2,500, uh, probably not more than that. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard to make right. more than that, right? right. So it's, it's kind of shitty, you know? Uh, it's really shitty, actually. Um, so yeah, basically what I did is like, okay, so, so do you, I asked Johan, like, can we get something, can I get something similar to this, the closest to what I get paid by the industry right now if we go there? They're like, I'm definitely going to try. We're going to put yeah. half of the fucking store in the paywall and let's fucking yep. give it a shot. I did that, but I also said like, you know what? This story needs to be written in Spanish for a Spanish publication that was my home back then, which is the main or major investigative uh, magazine, journalism magazine in Mexico, which is Proceso. The director and founder of Proceso is the only interview Mayo Zambada has given to someone. He died, uh, Julio Shedder. Um, but he founded this magazine with that kind of like report, strong fucking critical reporting, right? And trusted enough by Subcomandante Marcos, presidents, and El Mayo Zambada to give interviews exclusively to Proceso. The story I broke in 2013 about the CIA being involved was uh, my first cover on that magazine, right? Uh, it, was, it was the cover of that magazine. So they invited me to collaborate a lot with Proceso Magazine back then when I was, when I was like 10 years ago, probably 15 years ago. So I was like, fuck it. You know what? I love that. Th those dudes, they're having a bad time. They're firing everyone. They're losing money by the minute. They're about to implode. So probably this is going to be my last chance to feel again that I'm contributing to that fucking magazine, you know? Mm -hmm. So I called the editor he was super fucking excited. He was like, no, fuck, dude, I went, wait, do you have proof of this? I was like, I have the audios, I have photos, I have exclusive photos, I have photo with him. And he was like, sadly, dude, I don't think we have enough money to pay you for something like this. We're going through shitty fucking years right now. We're actually about to close the print magazine. And I was like, well, how much can you pay? And he's like, we can probably that's Pro probably pay a thousand bucks let's fucking do it just send me uh send me the money send me a wife and i'll tell you the story and he's like fuck yes let's do it and it, they treat the story with a lot of respect as well as uh grillo grillo uh, uh, with grillo we, i published our, the story in english and in spanish what with processo right okay Gorilla treated the story with the utmost respect you know he really packaged it well he, he served as my editor for this one so it was great working with Grillo. And I was like, dude, we might be up to something here. Dude. Mm -hmm. Like we breaking exclusives in English and in Spanish as well. Exclusive photos, exclusive footage, and then wrapping it with social, you know, with a YouTube interview, right. behind the scenes, that kind of <clears throat> shit. So that's kind of like what we're trying to do right now. And, um, and after what got published, first, the first thing is um, I got a call by Damaso's people. That was, dude, that's just cool stuff. <sighs> Are you advertising this shit? Uh, yeah, we, I do it on the podcast. I get everyone to do it. It's like a, it's like a become a gag now. Oh, shit, dude. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> <laughs> so I get a call by his people telling me that- By whose people? By Damaso's, the okay. like, leaks people. Okay. Saying like, hey, dude, um, so we might have a problem here. Damaso was not allowed to talk to the press, right? And he might get deported because of this interview. And I was like, dude, but this is probably something you knew, right? And he's like, no, all good. I'm just letting you know what's the... This what's is after the article's after out. After the article's out. Because he wouldn't hear... I think probably Damaso kind of like knew that this was going to go big, mm -hmm. but he probably didn't know that it was right. going to be that big, right? Right. Because, um, of course, it it made the Mexican government to push back again for his extradition back to Mexico, right? Uh, AKA the cartel. Exactly. He, I left a lot of the interview out, a lot of the things he set out. Everything I couldn't get a proof of, and that wasn't first things he actually lived through, 
I left it out. He talked a lot of shit about Los Chapitos, a lot of like shit about El Chapo, personal shit. Really? Crazy stuff. But I, again, I'm not in the middle of that war. That's not my war to fight, right? So right. why would I publish shit like that, that it's unproved, right? Um, so I left all that out on purpose. And I made a disclaimer about the Javier Valdez version, right? I I published the uh, version that that his colleagues and family members uh, said. The, 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 his colleagues and family members, his wife and kids, they are sure that it, it, it was him, right? So I published that thing. I published like, okay, so his family- They're sure it was- it, They're Minnelik. sure it was Minelik, right? And the authorities, whatever. Although he says this, I, yeah, anyways, um, so that was that. Um, and um, and then after that, Los Chapitos, through one of their cousins, which is another wild fucking story, uh, reached out to me by another Guzman, uh, a man who, I can't say his name right now, probably in the future, but he's supposed to be dead. He was... They allegedly killed him. He, he made the news. Like, they killed him. They killed this guy. And he's like, nope, I'm actually alive. I mean, I'm injured, right? But I'm alive. And I was like, dude, I mean, again, the vetting process, like, turn on your camera, blah, 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 blah. You did all this with all him? All this with him. And he was, I, a, he was a Guzman. Yeah, he's the cousin of, of Los Chapitos. Wow. And he's like, the first thing he told me was this. He's like, and I'm gonna I'm gonna lay down in Spanish and then I'm gonna translate. Okay. So like, compa, yo sé que todos tenemos un precio. ¿Cuál es el suyo por entregarme aquella rata? It's like, dude, I know every one of us has a price. What's your price to let me know the whereabouts of that fucking rat? Right? They wanted they wanted to find Damaso. Dude, I saw that fucking message for days. Just. No, it was a message request. I didn't open that. So I was just like, shit, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Is it real? Is it not real? Is this a threat? Or is this just like a friendly? How do you answer this fucking message? If I answer, I might be untangled in something I don't want to be in the middle of. Even if I had the location of Damaso, I'm not sure I want to share that shit, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to get killed for it also. Right, you know? right. <clears throat> the thing is, I don't have it. So what? I mean, if I say I don't have it, they're not going to believe me, right? Because they might think, of course you fucking have it. But I don't. Right. So I was like, and so I sat on it for days. Um, I had to go to Mexico to give a conference about what we face as journalists, Right. Uh, I, I'm trying to do more of that, more like public speaking for college. This was for a group of attorneys from Canada that they were trying to find inspiration into how can they keep being uh, working uh, in, a, in a world where there is a cancel, like strong cancel culture, right? Without being afraid of speaking, of, of using their right to free speech, right? So I was like, dude, if, if I get threats, if I my life is, has been threatened several fucking times, you can do this too. You, you're, you're only facing consolation. You're not facing, you know, death threats. Right. So that's basically the, the whole the whole thing I do when I go and say like talk public speaking. Um, and then I went. They had they had a dinner, but I, I didn't felt like going into a dinner. I was like, no, I need to go back to my room and think and sit about like what am I going to answer. To this DM that you to haven't even opened. Yeah, yet. exactly. So I opened it and I replied with a, with a lot of respect. This was after, of course, like betting this guy, right? Like I asked him like to move to a, to move to a. Uh, oh, so you. So, <clears throat> so you, I opened the, so he sent me this message saying like, hey, Luis, uh -huh. I'm this and that. So I'm like, okay. Ah, okay. Got it. Uh, send him my, my secured app. Mm -hmm. And then he moved there and then he sent that message. Mm. But it was a message request. So I was just, okay, shit. If this is real, I might be into something, in the middle of something that I don't want to be. Anyways, at the end, I, I just replied, you know what, man, like, uh, I'm going to give you the, the respect I give to everyone. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. If I were 
to do my job for money, I will have, I, I'm, I'm doing a shitty job, right? Because <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. not doing it for money. Right. Um, I'm, a, I'm a broadcast journalist trying to make a living, enjoying what I do because I enjoy doing what I do. Um, thanks for your offering. Even if I had his location, I probably wouldn't share it. And I hope you understand it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I understand that every story has two versions. If you and your family have a different version, my ears are absolutely open to actually hear you and tell your side of the story. Um, and that's it. And he was really respectful. He was like, dude, I just want to let you know that that fucking rat is a murderer as well. And you're not dealing with a good man as he's trying to clean up his name, whatever. And I'm like, I completely understand what you say. I'm not trying to clean up his name. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever you feel good to talk about it, like in me doing an interview with you, your story and your side of things, of your family, whatever. If Ivan or Alfredo want to talk, I'm all ears. Um, and he's like, okay, let me let me get back to you on that. And uh, thanks for your for your honesty. And wow, that was it. And that's where I got my Rolex and my Bentley outside. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I fucking knew it. <laughs> yeah, let's rolling on a fucking Bentley. <laughs> oh. That's why I had to pick you up at the private airport. Yeah, exactly. Instead of like I'm fucking not Tampa I'm International. No fucking flying United you knew anymore, dude. Was fishy man. <laughs> Good lord! Yeah, it's, how much money do you think they have? I mean, they they do have more than enough money, you know. Uh, they have billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah, easily, dude. Like, I mean, if you think about the fact that they're laundering money through major, major uh, artists in the U.S., uh, you, you know that they have a lot of money. What do you mean laundering money through major artists? Through events. I mean, I, I can't I can say because I'm not the type that says just things out of saying I'm working on something. Okay. But they launder money. They launder money through major artists. Well, like music, musical artists? Musical artists, um, um, sportsmen, you know. They, they do have a whole fucking machinery on, on laundering money. And we're talking millions and millions of, of dollars of money. Oh, so they're acting like record labels. And basically, I'm guessing this is how they could do it, but they could act like a record label and they could give a musician or a singer a ton of money in advance to produce a record and pay for their tour, pay for everything, events, mm -hmm. events marketing, all this stuff. You could dump, you could dump millions of dollars into that mm -hmm. to build up an artist. <clears throat> and free cocaine. And free coke. And free coke, yeah. Oh. Best quality. Whoa. That's a great fucking way to launder money. Yeah, dude. And that's just part of it. So yeah, I mean when you when you think about that, like it's okay, so it's millions of fucking dollars. It's not like you put a hundred thousand dollars to produce something like that, you know. Right. Um, so yeah, that was that was that. The conversation ended right there. And and I'm still, you know, trying to see if there's something, something else to be to like hopefully a good interview with one of these guys i yeah. mean i haven't heard of him because uh, uh, after that a lot of shit happened right like uh they they extradited a video yeah so last time you were here you we basically i think it was right after you went and went through a video's house after it was raided yeah by the military i believe yeah. and it was all shot up looted they stole all his watches yeah. all of his clothing and yeah. everything and it was it was insane and he had still been in custody by the Mexican government when you were in his house. Yes. But since then, I don't know how long ago it was, a couple months ago, he got extradited. Extradited, yes. Extradited. Yes. I mean, it was, it, was, it was due, right? And you met with his lawyer that day. You were yes. at his house, right? Yes, 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 yes. I met, I met with, uh, with uh, two of his attorneys and his mom. Uh, they were pretty pissed, right, about journalists mm -hmm. being there, trying to go into that house. Um, but anyways, I... I think I face I face a lot of like backlash, a lot of like uh, shitty comments on that video I have on YouTube from a lot of like fanboys, right? That they feel they they are part of whatever, and they're still fucking fanboys of of, of, of El Chapo and say like, really? oh, that was disrespectful. I hope you get get fucking pop for doing that. If you come into my house like that, I will definitely kill you, whatever. And it's like, dude, this is a house of a criminal that was doing a lot of crazy fucking shit, but he's behind bars, and this is. 
about my point of view of public interest yeah, of what yeah. happened, not only for the sake of what happened to that town, but probably for the sake of also what did the military did during that operation that was illegal. Like yeah, they fucking stealing, looted his house. Right? So it's like, dude, I'm pretty sure that you fucking fanboys are the most Idiots. upset about this. And probably the family was like, okay, this is proof enough as well that they fucking looted the fucking house and they shot a place where there were kids inside. Right. Right? It's about the truth. I'm not siding with the Mexican military. I'm not you siding with the criminals. They pulled up in fucking Hummers and shit, yeah. shot up a whole town, exactly, killed dude. innocent people. Exactly, dude. I mean, wrongdoing by the Mexican government, wrongdoing by these cartel members. In the fucking middle, it's a, a town of innocent people, old men, and two kids that are daughters of a criminal, but they 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 didn't willingly, you know, were, were there. Right? They could right. probably be killed. They could have been way more surgical right? in doing that. It was, and now, again, this is a criminal, and that's the way he makes his money to buy these cars, Rolex watches, whatever. Mm -hmm. that, that, that gives no reason for an authority to go and fucking loot his house and stole everything, right? Right. steal everything, right? right? It's wrongdoing all over. It's wrongdoing all over, and that's, mm -hmm. that, that's my main fucking goal on what I do. People say like, okay, you're siding with the Mexican government. And then people say, okay, you're siding with fucking cartels. And when I have like uh, sources on both sides of, of the spectrum, sometimes I get reached by by elite fucking Mexican military, you know, that are my sources. And like, dude, why are you siding with these fucking shit, shit people? And I'm like, what do you mean? Your fucking story, man, is making us look ugly, is making us look like, like we don't have enough you know, power or brains to do an operation. So you were siding with, with these fucking rats. And I'm like, dude, no, don't get me wrong. What your colleagues did was also wrong. And then I get calls by these guys saying like, hey, dude, wh why the fuck would you do that? Like, uh, are you, I mean, I know you work for the Mexican government, the U.S. government, and you were siding with them because that's what a journalist does. And I'm like, fuck no, dude, I'm not siding with anyone. Who is saying this? Cartel people, you know, some of my sources in Sinaloa. You have people like like high up Mexican military reaching out to you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, have, I have really strong sources also on the, on the Mexican military. Like in, really? In, 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 How high are we talking? How high up? Uh, high up enough to let me know several hours before Ovidio was extradited, that he was going to be extradited. Whoa. And that was, that was secret even for them. But because they were there, they just tell, they didn't tell them that it was Ovidio, right? They tell them, hey, we're going to extradite a person. We need to, I need you guys to show up uh, this prison, blah, 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 take out this guy, boom, take him out you know, within an hour. They went and they were like, oh shit, the guy they're going to fucking extradite is Ovidio Guzman. And one of them uh, is my source, right? One of, one of these, several of these guys are my sources. And so they, I, I heard rumors. I heard rumors that there was movement from lower tier people in the military. It was like, hey, dude, there's unusual movement on this prison. They're taking out someone. And I was like, hmm, let me ask these other guys who are higher up. Hey, dude, I'm hearing of movement on this prison. Do you know anything that's happening? It's like, dude, yes. Let me reach back to you in an hour. Okay, boom. They reach back. So I'm like, okay, now that this person is in the air heading towards the U.S., I can tell you. It's Ovidio Guzman. So boom, I tweeted it first. Oh, like boom, Ovidio fuck. Guzman got an extradited. That was hours before it was like making headlines or whatever. Um, and then when he arrived in the U.S., I also have good sourcing in the U.S. on law enforcement, and they sent me the first picture of Ovidio with the with the orange jumpsuit. Right? Uh, they they uh, a DA a former DA agent published on his Twitter the photo of Ovidio sitting on the jet on his way to the U.S. And then a couple of hours later, these other source I have in the U.S., uh, he sent me the photo of a video, uh, his mugshot, basically, right? He leaked his uh, orange jumpsuit. You have it on the, you have the photos I sent you. I think, oh, Stephen has it. On his uh, orange um, jumpsuit, that one. Yes, I had to put a wire mark because he went huge on Twitter. Look at the jaw on that guy. Yeah, dude. <laughs> he got a crim it. the crimson chin. <clears throat> Look at his size, dude. Like, he's... <sighs> 
I don't know if he's, there's a lot of people saying like he wasn't scared. He's probably just dealing with drugs or whatever. Um, he he's on, on. He looks high on coke. I mean, he is on uh, anxiety medication. So I don't know what that is. He is? The, depression and anxiety. He's, he's getting medicated for that. Oh, wow. Where where is he in the U.S.? In Chicago, Chicago, Chicago UMC, one of the worst. Not because of the Thai Thai security, or whatever, but because of the treatment they get. Mm. He is on the eleventh floor, all by himself, and the water either comes out freezing cold in Chicago during winter, or hot enough to burn to to, to burn your skin. And he doesn't have any. Yeah, like sun time, no windows. Uh, it's a shitty fucking place. It's a shitty fucking place. So, did you get the story from his lawyer on how they got to extradite him? Like, did was was there any pushback from the Mexican government side to the U.S. State Department on the extradition, or was this in was the U.S. and the Mexico? <laughs> and the Mexican government working together to get him extradited, yeah. basically just fighting the lawyer. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, the, the attorneys had set a bunch of what we call in Mexico amparos, right? Like uh, legal resources to stop his extradition. One after another, after another, after another. So legally, lawfully, mm -hmm. both governments will have to, will have to go and dismiss one by one of these legal resources, right? It mm -hmm. will take years 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 and still he will have a lot of other resources to stay in mexico both governments basically said fuck the law let's get this fucker out of it mm -hmm. and they didn't again i'm not siding with anyone mm -hmm. this is just the, the way things are the mexican u.s governments broke the law in order to extradite he was illegally unlawfully extradited to the u.s he had resources and not resources in place to stay in Mexico to avoid extradition. You can't expedite an extradition of a of a Mexican like that, um, especially when you have a lot of like legal resources in place. The thing is, the U.S. Uh, legal whatever agencies are pretty smart. So yeah. right now, even Ivan Archivaldo, he's not arrested, but he has an extradition order in place. Right? Who? Uh, the oldest of the Chapitos, okay. Ivan Archivaldo Guzman. Mm -hmm. He has an extradition order, even even though he's not arrested. But that extradition order is in place in the U.S. So when he gets arrested, that order enters before he can set up a legal a legal resource. Right? That's what happened with Ovidio. He had an extradition order uh, since 2019 that was still in place, just got to be renewed every I don't know months or years. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. has just to ratify, right? Like renew the extradition request. Boom, boom, boom. So when he gets arrested, even if he starts a legal resource, they're like, hey, I have a legal resource. Yeah, but the extradition is prior to that legal resource. He should still have a lot of like other legal resources like he had. Even one of his legal resources was saying that he, that wasn't him. One of his legal resources, he stood up before a judge in Mexico, a federal judge, to say. Ovidio? Yes. They ask him directly, are you Ovidio Guzman? Yes. Are you Ovidio Guzman Lopez? Yes. Are you the person on this photo? No. Are you the person of the, 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 this address? No. Are you the son of uh, Joaquin Guzman Loera? No. So you're not Ovidio? Yes. It was legal resource to say like, yes, I am Ovidio Guzman Lopez. Yeah. I have no clue who Guzman is. Uh, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, I have no clue who that is. Uh, and I'm not the person you're looking for, right? That was a legal resource. What is the government's, does the govern? does the U.S. have a, a plan in place for all these extra, why do they want to extradite these people to the U.S.? And why aren't they happy with them just sitting in prison in Mexico? I think because, first of all, the, um, the alleged damage they've done to the U.S. by trafficking drugs and that the target country was the U.S. It was harmful for the U.S., right? But Mexico is just a tra transition country when it comes to drug trafficking charges, right? <clears throat> so that is why most of them are extradited into the U.S. If the traffic or the crimes will be the other way around, they will have to be in Mexico first. 
for starters, right? For starters, the crime is committed against the U.S. because mm-hmm. the drugs are being trafficked into the U.S., right, right. not trafficked into Mexico. Mm-hmm. Second of all, uh, the fact that uh, the Mexican authorities didn't have any charges against most of them, they they they, they don't hold charges against many of these guys because they haven't set up a proper uh, paperwork, a proper investigation by by Mexican prosecutors. Mm-hmm makes them basically to say, well, we don't have charges in Mexico. We only have an extradition order to face justice in the U.S. But like our other friend of Plaga, mm-hmm. he had no charges in Mexico. Uh, El Nini had no charges in Mexico. All his charges are in the U.S. But when you look for his criminal charges in Mexico, there is none, not a single one. It's fucking wild. Where is El Nini right now? He is in Mexico City. Uh, sitting in a prison. Does he have an extradition? He has an extradition order. Yes, he's definitely most definitely going to be extradited as well, pretty soon. Dude, it's just so, it's so bizarre. It, you know, it's even just looking at the war on drugs and what what the plan was there. Like extraditing these people, that's crazy. They don't understand what's going to happen when they get extradited. They, I mean, do or do they? Do they see that? Look, these. These cartels are just going to be broken down into smaller factions and become more violent. Yeah, exactly. Like, let's think about, let's, think, let's uh, talk about like the Sinaloa cartel, right? Like, let's say they nav all of the chapitos. They, right. This member, the whole, the whole it becomes a power vacuum. There's power vacuum. And not only that, who's, who's going to be the next one up? Right. Who's going to be the next target? Right. It's immediately and automatically El Mayo, right? He's the only one left on that faction, on the Sinaloa cartel. And he's the one that nobody talks about. He's never been arrested. He's uh, about 80 years old now. Diabetic. And he's out there. All of his sons, but one, have been arrested in the U.S. All of them except one? And How many sons? Are, I think four. El Mayito Gordo. Este, Serafín. And Vicentillo, three. He has four. Three of them have been arrested and free now. Free man in the U.S. And so the one son that is still living in Mexico is running the organization. El Mayito Flaco. El Mayito Flaco. Mm-hmm. He's the only one. He's the only one still on the loose. Shadow of his dad. His dad. There's only probably two available photos of him. Uh, no, it's actually one and very old photo of him mm-hmm. that was uh, published by the DA on his warrant. Mm-hmm. Um, no one knows where he is. I mean, but he's basically, he's handling the, the operation with his dad. And didn't you break that story about him getting into how he got into the Sinaloa cartel with, <clears throat> he was friends with somebody in the CIA or something, or he, he got married to yeah. a girl whose brother was in the CIA. Oh yeah. I, I did a, I did a story that is on my YouTube channel explaining the, probable possible connection with El Mayo Zambada, the CIA. Yeah. Uh, his uh, oldest sister got married to this guy called, uh, I should have forgot his name, but he's a Cuban. Mm-hmm. And he started doing intelligence for the CIA during the Cuban revolution. Mm-hmm. So he got papers to be legally in the US. And when he traveled to the US, he started trafficking shit tons of drugs through Florida, actually. Oh, and then he moved to Las Vegas, where he became even a blo- bigger trafficker there. And then he got arrested twice for drug trafficking because he was being just too flashy in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. right? And then he moved to LA. And in LA, he was like looking for a new source, someone who can source him uh, first uh, weed and then cocaine. So he traveled to Sinaloa to meet with people sourcing, like say, okay, I want to find who could source, help me out source mm-hmm. drugs to the U.S. And in the meantime, he met Modesta Zambada, the oldest sister of El Mayo, and who I think, in my opinion, if you ask me, she's the real, real deal behind the Sinaloa cartel. She's the real one behind the organization. And no one talks about her. Because he's a lady. And Mexico is so machista, dude. Like, Mexico's like, no, there's no fucking way LA is going to be hand of the cartel. Dude, she's the oldest. She's the one who met this trafficker with ties to the CIA first. 
El Mayo was like, what, 11, 12 years old? Uh-huh. So we're going to believe that a 12-year-old kid started this emporium? She started it, dude, along with this guy. And then they brought El Mayo. Wow. And then El Mayo brought his brother, El Rey Zambada, who's free also right now. He was also arrested, extradited, and he's a free man. He's now a corrido singer in the streets of L.A. <laughs> All of the Zambadas, dude, but El Mayo, Modesta, and El Mayito Flaco, all of them are free men, have been arrested, complied, co- cooperated, and are free in the U.S. Didn't the son write like, some crazy fucking book? Yes. You were telling me about it last time you were here. It was like <clears throat> the cover of it. It's like wild. Yeah, it, uh, it, is a, it is a book written by journalist uh, Anabel Hernandez. Mm. Um, and it's called the... Uh, El Traidor, The Traitor. The Traitor. And it's an autobiography, like, saying, laying out his whole fucking story of of Vicente Zambada. Niebla. I showed you photos uh, of his arrest. He's like this handsome, Yeah. you know? And Uh and, uh, I'll next... Next, publish a couple of exclusive photos of of Vicente that I caught. Now, um, so El... El Nini is arrested. He's in Mexico City. Mm-hmm. And what about El Plaga? And El Plaga. Well, El Plaga is... And for people who don't know who El Plaga is. Yeah. So El Plaga is basically... He's not a head of the cartel. He's a henchman. He's the he's basically the equivalent of El Nini for a former Sinaloa cartel faction called Los Rusos, the Russians. The Russians. And, the, and El Nini was basically in charge of the Sicarios, right? Yeah, yeah. He was in charge of the killers, of the henchmen. Exactly. Okay. Of, of the whole security for Los Chapitos, right? He was the security hat for, for, for Los Chapitos. And the Plaga is the security hat for Los Rusos. Right. Los Rusos used to work for El Mayo Zambada and not long ago. They were the most loyal people for El Mayo, because El Russo is a dude that has been out for a while, dude. He's, since he was like 17, he's a, he's a fucking murderer, and really? he knows how to traffic drugs, how to move around. So El Mayo trusted him a lot, trusted El Russo a lot. Uh, short story long, I mean, long story short, <laughs> long story short, El Russo, uh, got into an argument with Los Chapitos. Um, everybody fucking hate Los Chapitos, too. Like, every other single faction, they hate on them. Why do you think that is? Probably because they're the inheritance of El young, Chapo. Young, and they're young. motherfuckers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's probably part of that, you know? Yeah. Um, Rich kids. So this guy started fighting with, with Los Chapitos. El Mayo gets in the middle and say, like, hey, dudes, like, this is not good for any one of us. So he asks El Russo to go to the border of Mexico with the U.S. to Mexicali, right? Right across Calexico, California. Mm-hmm. He's like, okay, that's going to be your turf. That's That's been the turf of mine forever. That's going to be your turf. Get there. Get your men over there. Don't come back to Sinaloa so we can avoid, you know, infighting. So he he did. He left. He promised El Russo that he's going to take care of his properties, of his ranch, his houses, all that stuff. So uh, the Chapitos aren't going to touch your shit, right? Because we're good now. So he's like, okay. And then two years after, or years, a year after, Los Chapitos went into one of his ranch and started burning his properties, taking his cars, whatever. So El Russo is like, no, you want to fuck it. I'm going to go back down there. And they started this massive fighting that was all over the news. It lasted like, they kept fighting for over like three weeks. Massive shootouts, a lot of killings. Even the Mexican Marine was involved. Allegedly, per what El Plaga told me, the Mexican Marine was operating on behalf of Los Chapitos. That's what he says. Uh, and so El Mayo kind of like got angry at El Russo and said like, dude, I asked you to never come back, especially not to fight. He's mm-hmm. like, yeah, but you made me a promise and you couldn't comply. So fuck it. I'm not going to leave my fucking ranch and properties to be taken over these guys, by these guys. So El Mayo decided to not back him up anymore. So he's like, okay, I'm not going to fight against you, but I'm not going to back you up anymore. So mm-hmm. we don't work together. That happened probably last year. So he became an independent. Okay. Right? Former Sinaloa cartel. And they operate hugely in Mexicali, San Luis Rio, Colorado, uh, across California, part of, of Arizona. And, uh, and, 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 yeah. And then, the, and then El Plaga reached out. <laughs> I had reached out. El Plaga, he reached out. He, the, the thing is, El Plaga has a huge following on Instagram. He has this massive account where he posts a lot of like his 
w- Rolex watches. Do you know his or, username? We could pull it up. <clears throat> I don't want to. I don't want to oh, okay. publicize his. Okay. You know, because I mean, we don't want to give him any clout. Yeah, exactly. Dude. Okay. Like they, they all are, are, are all up for it, right? And they they, love, this. they, they, they love, love the it. attention. They will fucking right. love it, and I'm not. I'm not gonna give that. <clears throat> okay. Up to so, anyways, he has this huge following mm-hmm. on Instagram. He posts. His, he posts his luxury cars, watches, traveling, guns. guns. He even posted another narco monkey, you know, he had oh, with, a, no. with a scar. He had a scar and a narco monkey on top of it. <laughs> so like Oh yeah, I saw the photo. I saw that photo in the uh in the article. In the article, yeah, right? Yeah. Um so I reached out like two years ago to him to see if he wanted to give me an interview because I was about to go to Mexicali and all that area. Uh he never replied. And and then probably a month after the interview with Damaso came out, he reached out. Uh-oh. And he's like, hey, dude, what's up? And I'm like, boom, again, uh, secure app. Reach, reach out to me on this one. So he reached out, batted him. He was, he was on camera asking for his ID, show his ID. He was driving a pickup truck, and he kind of like stopped in the middle of the night. Um, How old is this guy? Dude, he's like 24, 26. <laughs> like, he's young, man. And he's the head of a huge army. Um, so we talked about a lot of like Los Chapitos. He asked me like, "Hey, dude, did you really meet with uh, with Amazon?" And I was like, "Yeah, dude, yeah, yeah." And he's like, "Well, I don't like those kind of guys, but an enemy of my enemy is my friend." So like, okay, it's like, kind of get a hold of him and like, dude, I don't have any contact, any way to contact him. He contacted me, and then lost connection with him right he, he, he i don't have any means to, mm-hmm. to get back to him right um so he's like oh, okay dude so all, all good so what's up and i'm like dude can you give me a proper interview he's like no oh, let's do it in person <clears throat> i wanted to i wanted it to be in person but he's like dude i can't promise you that i'm gonna be around because my boss uh he calls el jefe r the, el ruso uh he moves me around a lot so i can't promise you that that i can be you know, I was like, okay, so let's do a video call, an interview, and if eventually uh, you have the time, I'll travel and meet you in person. And like by any means. So he laid out all this story about the fight, him fighting between the Chapitos and the Russo. He told me about he was two years ago. He was arrested because he um, he got into a gunfight with Mexican state police officers and they killed one of his henchmen when it was his right hand. El, or something like that mm-hmm. they, they killed him and they arrested him and there's this mugshot that you have also on, on the files where he's uh, where he's uh, he, that, that's his Mexican mugshot and he's all beaten up with a with a. <laughs> you can see his, that's El Plaga yeah that's El Plaga <clears throat> look at that haircut yeah dude the cop can you punch in on that a little bit Steve and you have his mouth all oh shit he got beat up huh really beat up dude and uh, his nose all broke. Look at that Louis Vuitton jacket. <laughs> he was. Uh, he told me that they were partying at a club in Mexicali, and then they they went out of the club like at seven in the morning. They were driving back to his whatever, and they got stopped by state police officers. And he's like, his friend was like, "Don't fucking stop, dude. Fuck him." He's like, "No, dude. I don't want to start anything." I mean, but he's like, "But why are they stopping us if they know who you are right. and who we work for?" And he's like, I don't know, let's just stop and see what's up. Yeah. So he's like, when I pull over, this guy, the tío, whatever, jumps out of the vehicle with his fucking gun and starts shooting at the police. <laughs> and then this guy starts shooting as well. And there's a, a couple of killings. Uh, and then they killed El tío. He tried to run, got arrested, got beat up. And allegedly, he was moved to a maximum security prison and whatever. But when he called me, I was like, dude, what, aren't you supposed to be behind bars? I was like, dude, I was free to the uh, three days after. Like, El Jefe R negotiated for me and they let me out. And I'm like, dude, are you fucking sure? Yeah, 100%, whatever. I vetted that info also through other sources and other means. And he was fucking out. He was out. And I was like, okay, so wow. this guy's really out. So when I published this story, I faced hard pushback by Mexican government saying no he is behind bars I the um, chief of police of Baja California she told me like I personally put him on a plane and sent him she out she told to, you this yeah, she, I put him out to Oaxaca so he's behind bars I know for sure and I'm like well check again because he's out 
I just FaceTimed him. Yeah. He's driving his truck yeah. down it, the street. Like, I don't know who you talk to, but he's behind bars. That's for sure. So then he had to show up for um, for a hearing. He didn't show up. And the federal church declared non-present. They couldn't find him. And I was like, of course, they couldn't fucking find him because he's out. Right. That's proof that he's out. And they're like, no. And then they put out a presser saying that my story was bullshit. And then they were, they were going to publish his photo uh, behind bars. So like, now we have him and we're going to publish his photo. Did they publish it? Of course not, dude. They haven't said anything after that. They they just didn't want to be, you know, left like fucking idiots. So he's just, it's just like uh, Caro Quintero. Yeah. After he got arrested. Mm -hmm. He's like, you fuckers, yep. I'll be fucking out of here in t 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And he's out. He's out, dude. And um, there is a search, um, a search website where you can search for people arrested. So when you look for El Nini, it says where he was arrested, by who, at what time, mm -hmm. and who is responsible for his uh, arrest, whatever. And where is he right now? Right. You know, El Ovidio as well. For right. this guy, it only says arrested, no time, no place, no agency responsible for his arrest, nowhere to be found. He's so, not so in the system. Why do you think he was able to get out, but not El Nini? Aren't they kind of like the same? Don't they have the same kind of power? In their organization, they have the kind of like same power, but their their organizations are definitely not at, not at the same level. No, the Chapitos faction. I mean, los Rusos are by far not even close to what Los Chapitos are right now for Right, so you would think El Nini would be able to get out easier than him, right? Not really, because when you are requested, when you are looked after the U.S. government, especially oh, for those charges... I see what you're saying, right. It's too hot. Yeah. They, they arrested another another. They guy. don't have as much heat on them exactly. as El Chapitos yeah, do. Right. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so so yeah, dude, that was, that was another uh, cool interview published again with Grillo, with Ioan Grillo, a crash out It's media. crazy the mindset of kids like this, this 24-year-old kid, and he thinks it's cool to be called the plague. Dude, yes. I mean, this is the thing. On the interview, I asked him, like, why, why do they call you, why do they call you the plague, la plaga, el plaga? And he's like, because I leave no one alive, like a plague. I kill everyone. When I go into a fight, there's no one left alive. And that's why I got the uh, trust of my GFR because he knows that I don't back up and I kill and I'm, yeah. So I was like, shit, dude. And I was like, what made you interested in this shit? And he's like, the uh, narco corridos, dude. Like, there's Mexican corridos. This is like, when I was growing up, there was this group, the most elite sicario group for El Mayo Zambada, Los Antrax. Los what? Anthrax. Los like, Anthrax. Uh-huh, like the Anthrax. Mm -hmm. They were huge, dude. I mean, El Chino Anthrax has this mythical story because he was arrested in whole, in Netherlands when he was arrested for being part of the Anthrax, right? He was put in jail in the U.S., whatever. Before that, he was the first, one of the first sicarios that was super flashy and huge on socials, right? He was mm -hmm. post watches, Lambos, whatever. He even post, posted a, a photo with Paris Hilton. There is a photo of Paris Hilton with El Chino Anthrax, dude, the head of Sicarios for El Mayo Zambada. Like, he was huge. Um, and he was arrested. He started cooperating. He was in a halfway house, and then he vanished. And then his body appeared into, like, shot into pieces in Sinaloa. Mm. Some say he was kidnapped by the, by the same organization. Some others say he escaped, went back. El Mayo said, like, now nah, you're a snitch. Cut him into pieces. So... That was the story of, uh, so, so, so he, these Antrax group, because they were fucking elite and flashy as fuck, a lot of people started like making corridos about them. So El Plaga got enticed by the corridos. He was like, dude, I want to be an Antrax. So he met someone in Tijuana, because this guy's from Tijuana. He met someone in Tijuana that had connections in Sinaloa. He went to travel to Sinaloa, introduced himself to these guys, to one of these Sinaloa cartel members. That's where he met El Nini. They were they were friends before because they were oh, really? they, they were starting together, trying to be henchmen, you know. Oh wow! And and this guy, he's he's uh, another like big player in the Sinaloa cartel. Mm -hmm. Told him like, you know what? You're not gonna make a lot of money with the Antrax. I mean, they they have respect. They don't make a lot of money. You're from Tijuana, dude. I know a couple of guys that work for us in Tijuana, La Rana y Aquiles. Two brothers working for El Mayo Zambada right there. Go out with them. Work for them. 
And that's where you're going to make money. And he's like, fuck yes. He introduced me to those guys. I stayed loyal to, the, to them. And I started making shit tons of fucking money by helping trafficking drugs and being part of their security team. I started growing up. El Nini started growing up with, the, with Los Chapitos. Mm -hmm. And then he went to work for El, El Russo. Right, because El Russo called for backup to Aquiles and La Rana. So like, hey, right. I'm, I'm gonna go fight back my turf in Sinaloa. He went with them. El Russo is like, hey, come work with me. And then uh, Nini and him started like fighting. So like this culture of these corrido, like these corridos, they're bas it's basically like songs, right? They're mm -hmm. like f famous songs about legendary drug traffickers, yeah, dead or alive, right? So like, there's this culture of the the allure that the allure of being this big cartel member or this person with power in Mexico, driving these big lifted trucks, driving Lambos, having guns, mm -hmm. and they market it almost to the youth of Mexico, the really young kids. It's like, wow, look at these people. They have this power. They have these great cars. And then the barrier to entry is like, you have to become a killer. Like you have a young 12, 13, 14 year old, like if you want to be in the cartel, you have to show us that you can kill. Is that sort of like how they bring them in? Uh, you know what? Like, I, uh, I didn't want to believe that the music has the power to bring someone to try to be part of the drug. I, I felt like it was almost like when, when the whole um, Columbine uh, Mm -hmm. Massive killing happened, and everyone they blamed it on Marilyn Manson. <laughs> Marilyn Manson. I was, I was like, dude, that that's fucking dumb. Uh, which it is. God, dude. That's but so the story ridiculous. of El Plaga, particularly in Mexico, with narco corridos, kind of tells me otherwise, right? Because he got enticed by the music, by the anthrax. He's like, I want to be one of those fucking guys. And he even uses a name that has to do with a viral infection, right? <laughs> the anthrax and yeah, Plaga play. Plague, yeah. So a lot of these kids, they work for that. They not, it's not even money. It's not even power. It's for like being famed and having their own corridos. And look at what Peso Pluma is doing right now. Everybody, everybody, no one really knew El Nini, right? Right. Until Peso Pluma started singing about him. Everybody wants to be El Nini now. If, if you go into my Instagram account, I have a, a photo of his arrest. And the comments, it's like free El Nini. Yeah, man, Alani's the real dude, and blah blah blah, and these, like everybody's like, you know, super excited about that man, and and they're like vouching for him. Yeah, but like the difference between those guys and the Columbine shooters, there's a stark difference. These guys are trying to make a name for themselves. They want fame. They want money. They yeah. want. They want a life. They're coming from nothing. Yeah, right? exactly. They're coming yeah. from poverty. Definitely. Yeah. These, yeah. these shooters at these schools, like Columbine or whatever, these guys were complete anti-social had no friends who knows what kind of like i don't know if they, if they were on depressants or whatever and the, these religious fanatics want yeah. to come after them blaming that marilyn manson is the antichrist they listen to these goth music these guys knew they were going to die exactly right? yeah, they, yeah it was a yeah. it was a suicide absolutely yeah not not saying not saying it was it, it is the same at all it's absolutely different different motivations different and marilyn situations. manson's interview with the guy who made columbine the Col bowling for columbine michael Dr. moore michael moore he asked him asked marilyn manson he goes if you if you could talk to these kids if you could say one thing to these two guys who killed everybody, what would you say to them? And Marilyn Manson's response was, I wouldn't say a word to them. Yeah. He's like, I would ask them questions. Yeah. And that's what nobody did. Exactly. So basically saying like, yeah. these kids were on her for for most part of his life. Right. They were this not is, her. Yeah, they had no one to talk to. That's probably the same shit. I mean, I don't know, dude, but probably a, a kid, because again, this whole story about these kids not having a chance and being impoverished and saying like this is the only way they could, you know, that probably happened with a different generation. That happened with El Chapo, with mm. El Mayo, that they grew up in extreme poverty in the, in the woods, whatever. And El Chapo started by killing people, right? He was, like, a, yeah. he was originally like a fucking Sicario. Yeah, yeah. But these guys, these are city kids. They're not rich, right? But they're middle class. They live well. They can go to school like El Nini... El Plaga. Mm -hmm. These kids are not like, that was my only option. They actually were looking for that option. They were looking for that, right? And, and it's, again, it's like, why? Why? Probably because how we all uh, put these guys on a fucking pedestal, right? We talk about these guys like they're major players. We kind of like look up for them and say like, oh, these guys, you know? And that is exactly why I try to interview all these people. Because I'm like, dude, I want to bring him down to humans. 
right? To what they face, to what they mm-hmm. are. Because otherwise, you only listen to the corridos about them. Right. And what, what do the corridos of El Plaga say? He's a badass killer. He's a good man. He has a good heart, but he takes no shit. That's why he kills a lot of men. And if you cross his path, he's going to chop your fucking head, whatever. Makes him look like this bravado, macho man mm-hmm. that is cool and he's fine. But if you cross my, my way, I'm not going to have mercy. And it's like, dude, no, these people are bad in the fucking head, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They're fucking killers. They don't give a shit. They move fucking drugs. They, right. you know, they, they, they're doing a sh- lot of like crimes that are affecting us, mm-hmm. all of us. And they face ugly lives. They face living like rats. They face living without, like, like these dudes. Like, I ask him, like, why will you be open to share a lot of shit on your Instagram? And he told me, like, well, I don't, I don't share the beheadings I do. I don't share, like, that kind of stuff that's going to get me in trouble. What I share is my luxury life, right? My watches, whatever, because that's why I do this for, right? For money. And if I can show it, then what's the what's goal? Mm-hmm. That lets you understand. He's, he's, like, he's like, okay, so these dude beheads people. He chops people's heads off. But he doesn't show that. What he shows is his luxury life. And he does that because on his head, he's doing what he does for the money to show. Right? So if, if, if he can't show, then there is no sense in what he's doing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's like it's it's making a name for themselves and like sort of symbolic immortality trying to you know, they, they, they get Carrillo's made after them and they live on beyond. Like if they die tomorrow, there's going to be a Carrillo or, mm-hmm. you know, some of these graveyards that have like these crazy memorials to yeah. these guys. People go there and party and it's insane. Yeah, dude. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's wild how they, how they leave. And I don't know what's going to happen with El Plaga. Is it going to get behind? Because after the interview came out, also it went huge in Mexico because the Mexican government actually kind of pushed back. So that made this story even amplified more. Yeah. And he closed his um, Instagram for a couple of weeks or months. Um, he recently opened it back up, and, but he he caught all connections, you know. So, one of your stories that you've most recently done that terrifies me the most is the story of this Titan software. Yes. How did you first come come to learn about this software and mm. explain what it is? Again, uh, it was it was an anonymous tip first. Um, one of uh, a source reached out again on Instagram. Mm-hmm. He said, "Like, hey, dude, you need to know about this software that Mexican and cartels are using." And I'm only sharing this with you because I think you are the one to publish this story, whatever, to find out more about it. And uh, I can't say a lot of stuff about this guy, so so for his security, right? But um, but basically, Titan, what this is, is a Mexican development, a software that is like a mega database for a lot of Mexican databases, right? It gets Mexican voter ID database, uh, phone companies, different mobile and uh, land phone companies, databases, uh, banks, most of the banks, probably all of them, um, credit scores, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera like criminal backgrounds, da, 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 and also has the capability to live track you. And it is as easy as to enter a full name or what we call in Mexico an RFC, which is your basic tax ID, or a phone number. And do, by doing that, well, these, these source offered me a login to go in and try the, try the platform. It was mind-blowing how fucking easy it is to just enter. I asked permission to a friend of mine in Mexico uh, if I could enter his name or a phone number to track him, right? Enter his info and it gave me a several uh, sheets of personal data like his most recent calls like a list of logs um, and then th- these database makes like this cr- call crossing to try to identify like how close the people he's talking to are to him like you can tell probably that he called his mom or he calls there, 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 there are like a hundred calls in the last month to this number, right? So it, it, the circle is. Who he talks to the most? 
exactly who talks to the most mm-hmm. and whatever like more most recent calls whatever it gives you a sheet about his uh credit score uh security That's background crazy. Train, uh, 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 yeah background check uh his license plates the cars he owns uh addresses different addresses through the years mexican border id license um what else i can't, I can't it, it was like a bunch of like shit dude like uh his different phone numbers um and uh a list of the last hour location uh every 15 minutes a pinpoint where every 15 minute he was he was for the last hour or the last two hours uh so you can track where he was where he's been the last 15 15 per 15 minutes dropping point like pop pop on a map and then you can access this live location what this live location uses it's a pro- a protocol called ss7 which is a which is a mobile protocol used by companies mobile companies all over the world so they can communicate between each other without this protocol if if i have verizon you have at&t we wouldn't be able to communicate with each mm-hmm. other that's why you can communicate with people in china or mexico or whatever but this protocol has been widely criticized for a while because of its vulnerabilities. It's super easy to access this protocol without any malware or whatever. And Mexico, a few years back, made this anti-monopoly law that uh, basically bans a single mobile phone company to own the whole registry or the, or the, or the biggest spectrum for the use of mobile technology, right? For m- mobile um communication waves right and what this does is that you and i can set up a mobile company in mexico right we can show up uh with paperwork and say like we want to start our own um danny jones uh phone mobile phone company Mm -hmm. it's super easy to get approved and you will have to pay the rent for access to this protocol right Mm -hmm. that you you pay that to the biggest companies because it's cheaper than to get one of your own Right, your own protocol. It's so like, no, okay. Pay you, for a license. Or yeah, you, you pay for the license that uh, AT&T is using mm-hmm. and you can use that for your own small company. So a lot of criminals and a lot of like these security software shady companies are accessing this SS7 protocol. And through that SS7 protocol, they can pinpoint where you're at live without even sending you a malware or whatever. It's just legal because that's access to a protocol that every legal mobile phone company has. Mm-hmm. And that's where they're accessing your your shit and live tracking you all over the world. On my article, my story on Vice News, for legal reasons, I I didn't want to face the U.S. government asking questions, ah, whatever. It was just too messy to say that it works all over the world. So I proved that in Mexico, but I proved on my own devices in the U.S., in Texas. And it worked because it works through SS7, or it can it also works through a different way of doing things, which is basically the the GPS, which is the triangle between the nearest uh, phone and right, 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 kind of like triangles, a three point point points your location. So they can take the software, enter your name or your phone number or your social security number, mm-hmm. and they can pinpoint where you are anywhere in the fucking world. Anywhere. Find your credit score. Find your recent call list. Read your text messages. I'm I'm assuming. Maybe. I I didn't access the. Uh, okay. No text messages. No, no, I don't. I okay. don't think so. I or probably I didn't because I I didn't <clears throat> work on the on the platform enough. Like I just went through the because mm-hmm. it's it, it show it 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 gives you a huge document, you know, with a lot of different pages and a lot of like excels and maps and blah, 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 and then you have to go and interpret it out what is everything. Right. Yeah. I sent you a video, I think you can put up a video of like how the screener uh, goes, when, how, it, how does it look like. But dude, it's so fucking easy. And the most terrifying thing, it's like, a lot of people is going to say like, well, there was Pegasus, right? Back then. It's no need. Pegasus. Pegasus, yeah. yeah. This has been happening Developed for a while. by the Israeli, uh, Israeli cyber thing. arm. It was a cyber arms, uh, basically, weapon, you, you could call it. But it was marketed by the Israelis as a tool yeah. to weed out criminals and it, terrorists. But exactly. obviously was not used by that. It was it, used by governments to, to, to weed out dissidents or journalists. Yeah. So the thing is, Pegasus... Look at all the information you have about Pegasus, right? Because it's available. It's information easily available. Well, that, that's, that's one of the, like, the sheets it sends out. 
Okay, so this is the the information that you get. Yeah, that's uh that's a brief. Uh, I will I will I wouldn't zoom on any info in case there is like you know, but uh, probably m most of the four numbers are not working anymore. So it's all good. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's uh that's that's how it looks. Whoa. Gives you a lot of fucking info, dude. Gives you a lot of stuff. So now Pegasus, the thing is, it was developed by a proper known company developing software and acquired by official means uh, by the governments, right? It wasn't acquired under the table. It was officially acquired by governments. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah it's like the, 200 grand you can pay for a license exactly. to Pegasus. The thing with, and they have the zero day exploit with that. So exactly. like you don't need to click on a link. You can just basically send some send, send it to somebody and it automatically infects their yes. phone. They don't need to click shit. Definitely more aggressive. Definitely more access. I mean, it gives you more access to a device, right? Because you can mm -hmm. turn on and off cameras, uh, microphones, whatever. Yeah. This shit is nothing like that. Right. But the, the, the thing I find more dangerous about this thing is that it is not acquired officially by governments. This is highly overlooked, highly shady. Um, the login, there is no information who's behind this shit. You don't know because it's a single developer in Mexico that gets a, a hand of people say like, okay, but the Mexican INE, the Mexican border ID, they have a lot of like firewalls. So it, so it's almost impossible to access that shit without that strong malware. Well, the thing is you don't need it because your malware is corruption, right? right? You pay someone in to let to, to give you the whole access to an updated database of that shit. Same with phone companies, banks, blah, 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 blah. That's how this shit is working. Now, this is, I spoke to the developer and he, he said, my intention to this was to provide a, um, a, a Mex governments all over the world access to track criminals. But I know that it's been used by, you know, having a bad use, whatever. Um, and this is not acquired on official cap capability, right? It's, it's been acquired by a single state commander that says, okay, the license is super cheap. It's about a hundred uh, thousand bucks. Uh, give me 500 licenses. I'll pay it on my own pocket and I'll, and I'll, I'll give access to my agents, you know, mm -hmm. so we can work this properly, this platform, but I'll sub rent it. I'm going to rent this out to criminals as well to people on the Cartel Jalisco, Cartel de Sinaloa, so they track rivals or day-to-day -day citizens. And that's how this shit is working. That's, that's, that's how they find people that they want to disappear, to kidnap, to kill. They use this kind and of... And people within the Mexican law enforcement or military are knowingly licensing this software out to the cartels. Dude, this is the biggest proof that Mexico is a fucking narco state. They're working side by side. You only have access to this kind of shit by invitation to a WhatsApp group. The, these WhatsApp group admins are either four or five different admins. It's a mix between state police commanders and cartel members, high-ranking cartel members. This is the council that'll give you access to this WhatsApp group where you have access to this technology, to signal blockers, to exotic animals, to tera, 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 a bunch of shit like passport I'll show you photos of pa like fake US passports but they're like because they're coming out of the consulate it's a lot of crazy shit dude like if you, if you need a different identity in Mexico you can easily get it easily it's it's wild dude it's, it's fucking wild yeah that's what that dude was telling me the guy you introduced me to um, who came in here What's his yeah, name yeah, 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 Fernando. Fernando, yeah, 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 Fernando, Fernando Puente. He uh, he was telling me how he when he was a coyote, they basically would bring you into a house. They would they would have a whole change of clothes for you and make you look like a fucking worker. Yeah, they'd re they create you a brand new passport and get yeah, you across dude. the border. Yeah, dude. I mean, they even they're even selling. Yo, Steve, pull up that tweet I sent you earlier. They're even selling. What is this, bro? This is bombs that they hang into. Drones. It, it even one of the selling points is like it has a hanger for the for your drone, so you can oh drop my it. God! So the DJI little consumer drones that you buy on Amazon and Best Buy, they can carry these things, uh -huh. and they just drop them. And they just drop them. A drone bomb. Yeah, dude. This is the kind of shit they're selling on these WhatsApp groups. Oh my! Bombs, God. dude. Twenty-two thousand pesos, which is 
A thousand bucks. And who is getting these bombs? Uh, cartel, this council in these WhatsApp groups. Well, these bombs. So the Mexican military is getting them and selling them on the black market to the cartels. Yes, exactly. Yes. These kind of like like high Jesus, level weapons. Bro. It's car. It's a it, it, people know about about um, guns. Uh, a car is pretty expensive. A scar, yeah. And this is a scar all covered in gold, right? With a scope and a lot gold of gold magazine, yeah. gold handle, gold butt <laughs> barrel. It's ridiculous. I mean, but what was that thing you were showing us earlier with that that fucking thing that looked like a uh, oh, the laser gun? The laser. Oh well, gun. that that gun that's one. Well, that's a single uh, uh, signal jammer. A they signal use, They use that against their own technology, right? Because if the Jalisco cartel has... That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if the Jalisco cartel has drones bombing, you know, with bombs, well, you need protection against that. But you also need protection against the government drones that are looking over your turf. Uh -huh. So they will, they will, they will, on the same group, they will sell these kind of shit so you can block. And how does this thing right here work? It, it's basically a shotgun that blocks the signal of, of your drone. So if you have a drone that is communicating through GPS to find its way, whatever, mm -hmm. as soon as you fire this shit, it blocks the signal of that, of that uh, basically shuts off your drone. So it drops. Oh my God, bro. Dude, it's, it's so wild that mo a lot of like police, they don't even know that this is happening on these WhatsApp groups because... This world is so small, the criminal world is so small that one time I was at a bar with one of my sources. He's, uh, he works for, for the Mexican military. So I was at a bar with them and we're talking this and that. And on the WhatsApp group I had access back then, I'm not part of the WhatsApp group anymore, but they, someone posted a pair of binoculars, but they look like super high tech binoculars, not, not your regular night vision shit. They look like really something, and they were like really expensive. They were selling those shit for 200,000 pesos, which is uh, like 10 grand. And I was like, dude, this looks like something really geared up, not your regular binoculars. So I show him to him. So I was like, do you have any clue what this is? Like what kind of binoculars are these? He looks at it. And he he goes pale. He's like, where do you get this? And I'm like, uh, uh, Source is selling them. Dude, no, no, no. Can I use your phone, please? And I'm like, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. What happened? He's like, no, just, just send me a photo, like a screenshot of that shit. And I was like, all right. Yeah, by all means. What happened? He's like, just give me a second. Picks up his, his phone. He calls someone. He's like, hey, remember that fucking pair of binoculars uh, you bought from me? Well, guess, guess, guess where they are. And and then he's like, exactly, dude. He's with with the Jalisco cartel. Why? Why are these binoculars in the hands of the Jalisco? He's like, okay, just think about that. Boom, he hangs his phone. He's like, dude, I sold this uh, pair of binoculars. This exact pair, because he, he's like, I'm pretty sure they zoom in. They have a mark where mm -hmm. I erase the seat, whatever, to a guy who works on the military as well. And it turns out he's selling this shit to the Jalisco. No, so I was like... Fuck. Bro. Okay, dude. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, dude. Like this world is it's, so. There's a they're they're sourcing from official, unofficial, military, police, U.S. military. Every, they're sourcing from everywhere, and they have access to a lot of fucking shit, dude. This was a major, major leak um, that this source granted me access to. He granted me access to. Look at this shit. What these are all IDs and passports. Yeah, U.S. U.S. resident, permanent resident cards and passports. They are not fake. They have all the all the ceilings, all the all the markings, because they're coming out of properly from the from the U.S. from a, a U.S. consulate in Mexico. How much money? What percentage of the revenue that these cartels are bringing in is from is from smuggling people over the border? Right now, dude, that is huge money. That is huge money. This uh, smuggler in Ciudad Juarez, he recently told me for a story that they, they are making more money from smuggling people than from smuggling coke. So he's like, dude, we're kind of like dropping that. We're now huge on the human smuggling side of it. Because for a single male, just to get him across the border, literally over and down the wall, they're charging 1800 US dollars for a single man. 
if you're moving a whole family and they 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 ask you to go to mm-hmm. i don't know new york yeah then you you arrange the whole fucking thing from they'll even drive you in fucking new york yeah dude i mean they they pass they pass they get you passed through checkpoints and then they'd say you're not on a bus right because then there's no more checkpoints after 20 miles from the border there are no more, more checkpoints wow there's only one well like there are checkpoints in a circular round uh 20 miles from the border and they get passed through that using different tricks and different <sighs> Play this video, Steve. This video is wild. I just saw this on Twitter this morning. It looks like these guys are somehow like they're tying this shit around those. Oh, that's beads, clever. And they're they're making them. What is it? They're widening the the bars or breaking them. They're cut. They're cutting off the. They're sawing those bars off. Oh, you, you'll see it. There it is. Is this the Trump wall? Yeah. They're just waving at the cameraman. Yeah, they're better. They they're laughing. Look at him. That, that dude is uh, recording. <laughs> it's yeah. a joke. They don't give a shit, man. Look at this. And again, are they really a threat? I mean, they, look at these kids and this no. woman. Yeah. Uh, they, they're not the fucking threat, man. They are not. <laughs> these guys are making money. So these guys are coyotes? These guys are coyotes, yeah. That's exactly what happens with uh, with most of the deterrence policies. How recent was this? Can you can you look at the tweet and see when this was or where this was? Like was where like specifically on the border was this? December 11th. This was posted. Okay, this was just posted a week ago. Mm-hmm. Just a The lady. cartels run the border now. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's pretty obvious. I mean, what ha- what was happening before before the whole deterrence, right? Nothing really. I mean, a lot of Mexicans will, were were coming in and back out. They were yeah. like getting across to work and then back to Mexico and then back the next day. But when you put in place deterrence policies, when you put right crocodiles and you know crazy shit, cartels are gonna bank on that. They're shit. gonna make money on. They're that. gonna make a lot of fucking money on it, and you make them powerful. By trying to stop migrants from reaching the border and not having a system in place, you're making them reach. If the borders were open, as people say, like they're wide open, well, who's going to charge for a wide open border, right? right. No one will be making money. Right. Uh, you will you will face a lot of like a lot of like uh, a, a mess of, of of migrants coming over illegally into mm-hmm. the U.S., right? That That's a different thing. But no one will be making money. No criminal organization will be banking on it. Mm-hmm. But when you close the borders, when you really close the borders and make it harder and harder and push people to more remote places in the desert, through the sea, across a huge wall, under tunnels, that's where they're going to cash in. And they're going to become more and more and more powerful because of the money they are amassing. The harder it is to do it, the more money they can make. Absolutely, dude. And when you can just sh- shove a couple kilos in a backpack and walk across the border legally, yeah, like this, it's yeah, not dude. that well, hard to do. Again, the migrants are not bringing drugs. The, the cartels don't work like that. They don't put two eggs in the same basket. They, 90, if you go into CVP, and I, and I really ask all the people to do that because it's open information go to cvp.gov mm-hmm. and look for the stats statistics on seizures right mm-hmm. how much drug is being seized through ports of entry and in between the ports of entry i mean through the desert through the wall whatever 99.8 percent is getting seized on ports of entry on proper ports of entry like shipping ports not like the uh, regular Bridges. Oh, 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 gotcha. Yeah, vehicles, commercial, uh, personal vehicles, whatever. Like mm-hmm. what we use, like ninety nine point eight. Very little drugs are being smuggled in between walls because it's riskier, and you don't need that shit. Right. What you need is a full border packed, like when the CBP officers are taking a long time checking on you and that's making a huge fucking line right on on, on the bridge mm-hmm. that's when they they're like so so these these holiday seasons like december a lot of mexicans go to the, to the u.s to buy gifts for christmas right so the so the um so the border waiting times are like 
fucking three, four, five hours. You have to stand in line to get across into the U.S. and shit. That's where the guys take advantage of that shit. There's, like, there's a lot of cars. We have more chances of pulling one car packed with fentanyl in 100,000 cars, you know? Fernando was telling me that there was a system in place, I'm not sure if it's still in place, where people, citizens of Tijuana, actually have, there's programs where they can cross the border every day to go to work mm -hmm. in the US, in San yeah. Diego or somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a border crossing cord. Yeah. Is that still in place? Yeah, they that, still do that? Yeah, 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 that's still in place. Which, I mean, again, it's it's for border crossers, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's, you're, you're, you're perfectly legal to go. You're Mexican citizen, and, but you work in the US. <laughs> you go back and forth. I heard a guy, this guy, uh, John Mearsheimer, was was uh, doing a podcast on uh, Lex Friedman, and he, they were talking about immigration. And basically, John Mearsheimer was making the point that um, the two main things for a country to become powerful are there's two proxies. One is GDP, and the second one is population. Mm -hmm. And he was making the argument that like people in the U.S., Americans— young Americans aren't having, ba they aren't making babies yeah. like they used to. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that the immigration of people from South America and Mexico is a good thing mm -hmm. because they're still making babies and they're still crossing the U.S. Yeah. We, we want more people. Yeah. More people is good and more people equals equals a higher GDP. Yeah, definitely. If, if you actually have a program to make these people enter the workforce legally, right? Yes. If yeah. you make these people enter the workforce, then yeah, you have you have a lot of people working, making money, moving money, and you have larger population, right? Mm -hmm. When you remove the whole race about it, you know, when you if you want a country just of white people, and you don't take into account immigrants and say like, well, they don't count. Let's just count for the white people because this is America, whatever. Mm -hmm. that, that that doesn't work, right? If you take into account a lot of like uh, uh, immigrants, say like, okay, let's let's make these people work and make them get into the workforce then you definitely have a stronger workforce right well pay paying taxes buying shit buying houses all this stuff well need. the crazy thing is like they 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 don't punish i don't know exactly what what the system is but i don't the, the people who run big companies that hire these illegal immigrants. They, mm -hmm. they know they have tons of legal immigrants working for them. Yeah. And they pay them cash and they pay don't pay them a lot of money. Exactly, dude. They're fucking... So they're, they're fucking... They're yeah, benefiting on it. Dude. Yeah. That's why Mexico is our biggest trading partners because we do what... We put 90% of our manufacturing in Mexico and we get it dirt cheap. Yeah, dude. I mean, again, this country is not in hands of bad politicians it's in hand of fucking robbers that are per owning huge companies they're stealing from the country there's they're doing all these crazy yeah. fucking shit like outsourcing for cheapest fucking labor benefiting everyone but right only their own pocket it's so whose fault is that is that the guy who's trying to work to pay his family and he he's not a citizen so he has to get paid cash but he's providing all this labor he's working harder than any fucking other person on the job site or whatever it may be is it their fault or is the fucking guy who owns the company who knows he's getting it's, this shit for 50 cents on the dollar it's corporate america dude, right that, what, is, what is who's fucking up they own the fucking country they're doing all these crazy shitty policies for their mm -hmm own fucking benefit but for the demise of the whole country mm -hmm. I, I i i'm pretty sure that any politician call it biden or call it trump they're well educated enough to know what's better for a country but they are in the fucking hands or the paws of corporate america yes. but they don't give a shit yeah. They're going to tell you like, no, you know what? what's best for our country? Let's outsource everything to China. Let's outsource everything to Mexico. Right. And let's, and, and, and let's, uh, let's uh, let these uh, illegal immigrants work illegally and get paid cash instead of like actually put them on the workforce and make them pay taxes like right. anyone of us for the benefit of the country, right? right. And them because they're going to be legal. So it was a win-win. Mm -hmm. the, the only ones losing is the owners of that company. They're going to have to pay taxes and employees and all that shit they don't want to do that yeah because they want to earn this extra fucking penny yeah and the politicians all they want to do is they they're going to do whatever it takes to stay in power the same power yeah yeah and if, even if these guys corporate america call it corporate cartels american corp american cartels whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> they work as fucking cartels dude exactly right. the same shit it's right the same shit and they own it's the just it's just it, it's within legal boundaries there's a machine there's a mechanism in america that allows this stuff to work legally yeah. and i mean 
senators and politicians they're they're basically prostitutes to big organizations exactly pharmaceutical dude. or whatever it might be exactly dude. yes that's that, that that's what's happening with this country which is we we talked about this uh yesterday like this is still like this is a country that manages to every 80 70 50 100 years to renew itself and it's fucking great and it's because of its people right because mm-hmm. of the benefits that people has they kind of like take everything for granted but when when this country feels that their level of comfortable is being threatened, that's when it steps up. And it's great. And it's it's something that it's not happening in Mexico. Places like Mexico, we're optimistic about it. Mm. We say like, no, right. this year we're doing great. We're doing better every year. But in reality, we're going to shit. It's, your, it's just our opinion that it's naturally optimistic. And we're, we're feeling that we're doing better Every administration, every year, we now have a we, we now have train, we now have electricity, we now have whatever. Fucking country is going to shit. While this country, the opinion usually goes like that, but the country goes like this. It, it always comes up right. first, right? It's cyclical, and and it's because people still has the capability to turn the country over, right? To say like, okay. It's not Biden. It's not Trump. It's not the migrants. It's the fucking corporations. Let's fucking switch that up, and and it and it gets a lot of sacrifices for the people, right? Like mm-hmm. economical depressions and all that shit. Right. But it works at the end, and this country renews itself, and that's that's beautiful about it. You know, that's 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 yeah. cool. Well, bro, I always enjoy these conversations with you. Same, bro. Your flight is. Uh, coming soon we yeah. got to get you out of here oh, but, um, to catch. <laughs> but i really enjoyed that w- where do you envision the next wh- where do you envision the the dynamic playing ground of the cartels in mexico going and the factions where, where do you think this is going in the next like five years uh, the next five years are going to be definitely interesting because the whole playground it's going to be on this side of the border this is where everybody's gonna be either arrested or free or snitching or talking or try or, or on trials and this is gonna become really interesting to watch all these legal developments i'm pretty sure that we're gonna start seeing also killings in the streets of the u.s from these players right it is not the first time it happened before in miami it happened before when the all the Colombian cartels were arrested and brought to justice into the U.S. after Pablo Escobar. They all were here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. snitching, talking, uh, playing their cards on this side and killing each other on, on this side of the border. And this is what is going to happen eventually here with the Sinaloa cartel, probably most on the West Coast and L.A. and all those places. Mm-hmm. But... But the next playground for these guys for, for the next five years, because you, you're going to have the uh, trial of a video. Mm-hmm. Probably one or two other chapitos. Probably some of them are going to get killed in Mexico. Then you're going to have the Mayos. Uh, then you're going to have new players, the Sinaloa Cartel. You have going to have a Nini, Damasos, you know, all these people that are already on this side of the border. Three mm-hmm. out of the four kids of El Mayo are on this side of the border. Uh, one chapito and his security chief is probably going to be soon on this side of the border. Damaso is on this side of the border. So everybody, everybody's going to be on this side of the border cooperating with authorities, and that's going to play out really interesting. Well, I'll be following you closely. Oh, yeah. Again, tell everybody where to watch your videos and read your Substack and all that. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm going to I'm gonna rebump my YouTube channel, hopefully make it more consistent. Breaking news there before on Legacy Media. I'm, I'm trying to make the uh, leap of faith, you know, with your help, of course. Uh, <laughs> when I relaunch with some good stuff, um, I'm, I'm going to be back and, and asking for a solid from you to, Hell yeah, to help man. me rebump my, my YouTube channel, man. Hell yeah, man. I'm psyched. Um, I'll link it below. Yeah. And uh, thanks again, man. We'll get you back in here sometime next year. Fuck yes. All right. Goodbye, world.